today. Today, I want to share with you uh, some practical advice. What I think I've learned in, in, in the past few years about applying this method several times and adjusting it and, and, and tweaking it, as we will see, and, and giving very concrete, step-by-step, -step, practical advice about how to apply it in practice. Because uh, I noticed that as, as a reviewer and as an editor, I noticed that there seems to be some misconception about what this, uh, what this, method, uh, what this method is about. And also, to some extent, just, just as the, about 10 years ago, there was a hype around it. Now I think there's a, an unfair pushback. And I think that the best thing we can do is to, uh, to have a better understanding about how to use it, when to use it, and why to use it. So with no further delay, with no further delay, let's start, let me share the slides they prepared. And why isn't it, why aren't they there? Mm -hmm. Okay, finally found. Can you see my slides now? Yes. Yes, certainly we can. Good. So, like last week, last week, for those of us that joined us last week, we talked about theorizing from qualitative data, but we did it with a focus on case studies. And ideally, initially, the idea was to have a single webinar dedicated to both case studies and grounded theory. And then we realized that, um, that I actually probably I had too much content to cover in a single webinar, so we decided to split it into two. And just like last, last week, I will start with some disclaimers. The first disclaimer is that I feel kind of awkward to explain a method and take the liberty of explaining a method developed by somebody else, by Dennis Joya and by his uh, doctoral students and co-authors, uh, in particular, Kevin Corley and Hamilton and others. But I'm reassured by the fact that that both Danny and Kevin Corley had a look at uh, earlier versions of this presentation. So somehow I have their blessing. I'm, I'm just sure that, that I seem to have interpreted fairly uh, what, what they do or what they, how they see this, uh, this method to be implemented. Second disclaimer, what I'm going to present is not the only way in which the Joya methodology has been applied. Uh, you will see that there are variations. Uh, we will discuss some possible variations. Uh, Dennis Joya and Kevin Corley have also applied some variations over the years. Uh, personally, I don't think I've ever done two studies using exactly the same method twice. Mm -hmm. and I think that's important. That's a, I think it's, when, when applying the Joya method, you need to understand that there are some things that need to be done that way and some parts that should be adapted and, uh, and applied to the particular research setting, a research question. And understanding what is what I think is absolutely crucial. So what I'm presenting is what I think it's worked for me in the past. And, uh, uh, and what I think is coherent with the fundamental premises of these methods, which is like showing you how your emergent theory is grounded robustly in your empirical observations. And we will see that, that this fundamental principle has important implications on, for instance, the structure of the data structure and how you do things. Hmm? It is possible that you will see published work, even work published in very good journals, that somehow differs from what I'm saying today. And that's okay. Sometimes it made perfect sense to introduce those tweaks. Uh, sometimes maybe the reviewers were not so strict in evaluating. And I've seen some applications that I thought, but anyway, just is to say it worked for them. This, what I'm going to say today, it's what worked for me. You figure out what is best given your own research setting and your own, uh, and your own research question. 
Third disclaimer, I'm not saying that the Joya methodology is the only way to do grounded theory. It is one way of doing grounded theory. Uh, and it, even though Dennis Joya doesn't always call it like that, uh, because then you get into a fight with people that say, oh no, that's not the right way of doing grounded theory. So you just do it. Uh, going back to what we discussed uh, last week about the dangers of labeling your uh, research whenever there's a label that has uh, is in the middle of, uh, of, of, a, of a debate around different camps. This is one way of doing grounded theory or what I think, what I understood grounded theory is that I found useful. Uh, it is not the only way to code qualitative data or to approach coding more generally. There are no, here are just some uh, great um, references that I also found very uh, useful, inspiring, uh, of, that describe different ways of, of coding than what I'm going to talk about in the future or partly different in, in, in the next few, the next hours. Third disclaimer, I'm not Mm, doing this to promote or, or, or impose or even promote this way of doing grounded theory or doing qualitative research. This is a template and my purpose here is not to tell you you have to use this template, this is a great template, this is the best template. No, it's simply what I'm trying to do is to enrich your toolkit of templates, methods, techniques, by sharing what I think I've learned. So that then when facing your own problems, research problems, your own design, your own setting, you can see if it works for you or not. And my concern here is not so much like promoting the use of this, but trying to make sure that if you want to use it, you use it well. Because as a, as a reviewer and as an editor, I often come across papers that say we use the Joya method, or somehow they don't say it, but they clearly hint at this method, but they just don't do it right. And that's fine, but then, then you have problems. And, and I think that if you want to do it, do it right. And hopefully the, uh, the tips, the advice that I'm going to share will help you in that direction. Before moving into uh, a more step-by-step -step discussion of how to implement the Joya method. I, I think it's important though to spend a few minutes to discuss templates. Hmm? Because later we will go and discuss the anatomy of the Joya methodology. Um, what tables are you supposed to use? What figures, how are they, where do they come from? What is their structure? What should go in there and what shouldn't go in there? Then I will take you to the process of how I produce these tables, these figures, and especially the theory that comes at the end of the process. And then finally, we will discuss some seem to be more, more or less promising areas of application. But before doing that, I think it's important to say a few words about templates because there has been in the last uh, year or so, or couple of years, some heated debate around templates and the use of templates in qualitative research. And I think it's important to be aware of the, uh, the opportunities, but also the risks involved in using templates. What are templates? Templates are standardized ways of conducting research that are used as formulas for shaping the methods themselves, especially data collection and analysis. So templates are guidelines are standardized guidelines that say, this is the right way of collecting data, analyzing data, uh, given certain research goals. The Eisenhardt's template for comparative case study is an example. If you want to explain variance across a population of cases using qualitative method, qualitative data, then Eisenhardt's offer you a step-by-step -step guide about how to do that. And then there's the Joya method that uh, allow, it, it's, again, it's a set of mm, guidelines about who, how, how to approach the analysis of qualitative data, uh, mostly interview-based, to develop a, a process model. 
rather than a variance part. But we will return to that. These are just the most common examples. And there has been a lot of pushback recently saying, look, templates are dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, templates may be rigid. They may be optimized to uh, allow you to, 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 to do certain things in certain circumstances, but may not necessarily apply to uh, all research designs, all types of projects. Mm -hmm. And using them uh, and applying them without thinking just because you have qualitative data that may not necessarily may not necessarily be the best way of analyzing those particular qualitative data, giving that particular research question. Mm. Uh, by the way, mm, all these bibliographic references, uh, you some of them you found them in the um, in the announcements of this in the message that announced this webinar. Others you will find them in the uh, in the web, the YouTube page where the recording of this webinar. Hmm. Templates may mislead novice researchers about the complexity of qualitative research. You may think that, oh, qualitative research is easy. I have multiple cases, I do Eisenhart. I have a single case, I do Joya, and that's the other reason. Actually, it's much more complex. And there are many different possible methods that you can use, and they may be more or less appropriate given the particular problem that you are facing. Templates may induce researchers to formulate applications and replace reasoning, thinking about your data with proceduralism, what, what Bill Harley and you Cornelison called proceduralism. Just thinking that you have these standardized step-by-step -step guidelines, you apply those, it's a formula, just data in, data like a theory out, it's easy. And actually that's not the case. You always have to think about what you're doing consciously about the data that you're using, what are you doing with them, how can you support certain claims. Finally, there was concern, widespread concern in the last few years that the, the increasing popularity of the Joya method would somehow lead to marginalize other methods, other qualitative methods, ethnography, uh, discourse analysis, uh, just to cite some of them, case studies, because everybody would end up doing the Joya method. And, uh, and that was not necessarily a good thing, given that one of the strengths of qualitative research is the, the, the methodological pluralism. And I, I, I agree with this, and I'm, I'm not disputing this way. So uh, what should we do about templates? And again, there has been a lot of suggestions. Uh, for instance, you Cornelison, uh, advocate the importance of being aware of and open to different styles of theorizing. Mm -hmm. Thick description as a form of theorizing or configurational form of theorizing. It's not just a, a, a what he calls a factor analytic process model linear kind of theorizing. Uh, in a recent article, Bill Harley Cornelison suggested very interesting mm, approaches to reasoning that should help us not fall into formulaic applications, but considering competing application explanations, uh, considering, alternative, considering alternative frames to explain what happened, but also what didn't happen and what could have happened, and trying to select explanation that seems to better explain the, obs the empirical observations I have. So engaging more consciously with the, uh, with the data and the, the qualitative data that I have. Mike Pratt, Scott Sonnenschein, and Martha Feldman, Feldman uh, uh, wrote a very interesting piece about methodological bricolage, and saying, actually, it, we should do the opposite. Like, we should stay away from templates, learn basic techniques, what they call moves, and then, depending on the particular project we have, then customize in a very mindful and conscious manner uh, the, the particular tools and techniques that we, that we have. And finally, Kevin Cole himself, Tima and Tima Banz and others, they, they, they pointed to the importance of actually stimulating a dialogue between editors and authors so that there's a, a more conscious uh, debate within the editorial process itself about whether certain templates have been, are, are being applied properly or not, going beyond what sometimes seems to have become like more like an ideological preference for 
certain methods or against certain methods. And, and again, I think this is all great. I, I, I completely agree with this. Where I have a different view, and I think you know, I'm, it's, I, I'm less negative about templates. Uh, so for what it's worth, yes, templates are risky. Templates, if not used well, they may induce you to think that it's simple, they just disconnect your brain, think that you can just fill a table and a figure with some ideas and some, and some, uh, uh, some fragments of interviews and that's it. You know? But I think that the problem is that on the one hand, there's a, 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 there's a superficial understanding of the template. The problem is not with the templates. The problem is that too many people don't understand the templates. They use templates as boilerplates. And they, they believe that simply by saying, I've done the Joya methodology, and by showing structure, data structure, data table, saying I've been coding first order, second order, uh, and, and that's sufficient to reassure reviewers. And it's like, eh, we can see through that. We can see that you're just saying what you think we expect you to say, but you're not really doing it consciously. You're not, you didn't really do it knowing what you were doing. And there's nothing, I mean, it's not their fault, is that, as we would say, that, that, that there's lack of training. That's why I'm doing this today, because I think it's important to help people understand and use this template better. Hmm? Because there's lack of training. Because, uh, you know, it's not that, that Danny Joya didn't have time to write a, a book about how to use his method. I don't think you need a book, okay? But perhaps, um, I don't know, people are not interested in writing the nitty gritty stuff, the, 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 the little things that you have to do to make it work. Hmm? It's important to give broader uh, framing of the principles and, and, and maybe that's something that the authors or the journals themselves don't consider particularly attractive in a published piece. So that's why we're doing this webinar today. Uh, I think the problem lies also in inappropriate recommendations or rejections. Like at, at a certain point, too many people were being invited to use the Joya method even when it didn't make sense. And that created some resentment and say, well, I, I don't think it's appropriate, but somehow reviewers say, why don't you do like Joya? That, that will help us all understand how you got your data from your, uh, you got your, your, your theoretical insights from your data. Or sometimes, even recently being rejected and say, well, no, no, why don't you ditch that and produce a more uh, rich and thick account of your data as if then it would, it's like, I'm sorry, well, we have sometimes it's appropriate, sometimes it's not. And, and which goes back to, to Kevin and Tima's point about having more of a dialogue between the editor and the authors about the appropriateness of certain methods. And, in the end, this boils down to this insufficient clarity, at least in my view, in my experience, about how to properly apply the techniques associated with templates. We know the principles, we can see the manifestations of these templates, but what's behind, what has to happen in order for this template to be applied is different. And I noticed there are a lot of questions and we'll get to there in a minute. There's just one more slide that I wanna show before that and say, well, if you use them wisely and reflectively, and I understand that I'm taking a position that would be criticized, controversial, because now the, the mood is against templates. But templates, as, as Bill Harley and Yuko Lenis also admit, they are an attempt to codify past practices and conventions for a particular qualitative method. It's an attempt to, 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 to establish in a relatively normative way and, and, and practical way, what you should do in order to apply that method properly. The real problem then may not be that, that, that we have templates, but that these templates are not explained enough. There's an under codification. It's not that the templates are rigid, but that the templates are not detailed enough for us to, to understand really how you're supposed to use them. And it's not that we have too many templates. Maybe we need more templates done well and used well. Uh, I, I agree with, with, with Mike and Scott and Martha Feldman about the methodological bricolage. And that's what I do. 
If I go back and look at my project, that, that's pretty much what I do. I, I have in the back of my mind some techniques associated with the Joya method or ground the theory more generally and techniques associated with case studies. And I combine them and I adjust them based on, on what are the particular requirements of the project. The problem is that to do that, uh, I think it's important that you master the moves. If qualitative research is a craft, craftsmen improvise, yes, but first they master all the moves, all the techniques. And that's why I think it's important to have webinars like this that go into the practical details about how to do it. And they give you a better awareness of where this template seems to be more promisingly applied and where it's better not to use it or where you need, may need to, to adjust it. Also, there may be projects that actually fit this template, so you never know. And, and, and then it's important to know how to use it well. And finally, you gotta start somewhere. And, and to me, this is always a very good way to start I'll take a first step at the analysis of interview data and then things will, will evolve, will be adjusted and there will be, uh, there will be a bit of a bricolage, but as a way to start approaching the analysis of qualitative data, I thought that I always found this particularly useful and at least learning this template may give you a place to start. And I'm especially thinking about young scholars that may be told you have to be reflective, you have to be, uh, you have to do a bricolage, you have to reason, you know, it's like, yeah, okay, but now that I have all these interviews, what do I do with them? And how do I move from this to a model? And I would take, and I would pause here um, before moving to a more specific discussion of the Joya method, because there may be uh, questions, or at least as it, uh, I see Ignacio having a, a question. Yes, um, hi professor, I don't know if you can see me or hear me. Um, yeah. yeah, so they, 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 I'm Ignacio, I'm a second year PhD student at the Science Business School and I just wanted to ask something about the, the, the ontological and epistemological foundation of the Jaya method, specifically because I've seen it being used in both interpretive and positive studies and in very similar ways. And I find that a bit problematic because it kind of mixes, mixes different ways of understanding science, of understanding data and findings. So like nobody has really answered this for me, but it's like, what really are the epistemological and ontological foundations of joint method? Is it more interpretive for, for more interpretive research? Is it, is it more for positive research? Well, Dennis Joya is Beautiful. very clear that it's based on a assumption of social construction of reality. It is designed and intended to be an interpretive approach to data analysis. Then it could be that this infrastructure could be applied to produce claims that are more positivist, if you will. I am, as I was explaining also last week, I'm less concerned with the labeling and more with like, did what they do make sense? Are the theoretical claims that they are making warranted by the data they produced and the way they uh, analyze those data? So yes, it is a method that ideally is interpretive and we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but I can see ways to, in a spirit of bricolage, I can see ways to, to, to take these um, techniques and use them in a more positivistic way. It's ground the theory. Ground the theory, they, no, they say there's an interpretive ground the theory and there's a, a positivistic ground the theory. And I know I'm oversimplifying a little, but I don't think how in practice those two things really differ much. And I know I'm, I'm going to get a lot of criticism for that and saying that I have misunderstood ground the theory and blah, blah, blah. But to me, it's more like, what makes a difference is what kind of data are you using and what kind of claims are you making based on those data? That will give you the extent of is this used interpretively or positively. But then when it comes to, to the actual coding, it's not so different after all. That's my, my experience and my impression. But again, 
as I explained last week, I'm not a methodologist. I'm just a humble research worker. I hope that answered your question somehow. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Brenda, hi yes, again. Yes, uh, hi again. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, thank you for the last time. It was a very, very good session. Uh, my question today, uh, uh, David, is uh, is regarding, you talked about methodological uh, bricolage. Uh, so how does a junior researcher, uh, you know, bring out the necessary rigor? Because uh, I, it's an extension of the question, which uh, uh, I forget uh, his name. He just asked earlier, because we don't understand what the philosophy is, and that does take time to understand. So how do we, in our research journey, how do we bring in the rigor? The philosophy of what? Large? Of uh, JUA, of uh, thematic analysis. Where do we use what? And how does it, how do we apply it in well, qualitative? Well, hopefully, hopefully um, today it will be clearer how this method is an interpretive method that is based yeah. on assumptions of social construction of reality. Then, of course, in a spirit of bricolage, you are, I, I, I could not say you should never use this in a positivistic way, because that would betray somehow the spirit of bricolage, because I could see some moves, some codes, some displays used individually, they may support some positivistic statements about your qualitative data. And the problem is that you are conscious of that, that there's a conscious engagement with the data, that, that you, you're reflecting and on, on where your claim, what warrants your claims. And I think that the article that I mentioned by, by Bill Harley and Hugh Cornelis and puts it very well uh, in terms of, of awareness, of mindfulness of what you're doing. Even Bright and colleagues, they, 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 I think it's a, there's also a, a great articles about trustworthiness and different ways to establish trustworthiness. Right. Uh, so to me, it's less about the labeling and more about the more conscious thinking about what you're doing and whether it really makes sense and whether you can really support those claims based on the data you have, the evidence you have. And then those claims could be about some mm, factual, let's say factual in brackets, patterns, uh, or about how people make sense of their own reality and how this affects social dynamics. But uh, mm. it's the it's the mindfulness of your reasoning. It's the the it, it's mm, the the repertoire, the toolkit of of techniques that you develop that eventually is important. Right, um, so I'll reserve one question for later because I'm, it's your experience, which is, you know, you know, you need to pick up this and you need to pick up that. As somebody who's starting out, I am fairly all over the place in that way. So I'll come back to it yes, at the end. Yes, I understand. Yes. Hopefully at the end of the day, you will have understood better these templates, and at least you will have understood yes. better how and when to use this. And, and, right. and to me, it's, it's really about that, like learning the basic techniques. And once you have learned the basic techniques, then you can start combining and elaborating. Right. Thank you. Ibrat, I think we um, have... Uh, David, a couple of things. Um, one yeah. is a question from me, and then another question from Robert, who unfortunately cannot raise his hand. Um, but just a question from me. I might be jumping ahead. But could you elaborate what you mean by grounded theory? Sorry? Could you elaborate what you mean by the grounded theory, please? Uh, no, because I know that then people will start saying, that's not grounded theory. <laughs> I mean, grounded theory is, is, a, is a way to, to generate a theoretical understanding, starting from an analysis of qualitative data uh, is about mm, generating the making sense of reality using qualitative data in a, rel in a relatively systematic way. So then you could call it inductive, you could call it abductive, and that's more like how much do we really know about a particular phenomenon? 
are you starting from scratch? Are you trying to build a theory from the bottom up of something that is completely untheorized? Or are you trying to elaborate uh, uh, a theory that we already have and maybe applying it in a different context? But I mean, people more qualified than I am has uh, discussed what grounded theory is, what grounded theory is not. There's a great piece by Roy Sotheby. Um, grounded theory has evolved. Even Glaser and Strauss at some point disagreed about what the right way of doing grounded theory is. I'm, do, you, do, you, do you need more than that? No, I was just interested in um, how are you thinking about it in the context of this conversation? As I said, I think it's about generating theoretical explanations from reality based on an observation or qualitative observation of that reality, often filtered through the eyes of the people that experience that reality firsthand, the knowledgeable informants that, uh, that Dennis Joy talks about. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, Robert wants to ask a question as well. Yes, and I hope uh, my voice uh, comes through. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, explanation. I was very much triggered by what you said with regard to um, abuse, I would almost say, of templates and boilerplates, uh, which ring a bell to me. I, I come from a different field. I've uh, been uh, some three decades busy in the world of uh, project program and portfolio management, and I'm now trying to apply grounded theory to get a better feel of uh, why projects go wrong, because there's a lot of things that are process and so forth, but there's this whole thing about people, culture, relations, uh, which does happen in the exchange of words between people, be it in writing or in conversations. And to that, we're trying to use ground fear to, to uh, find some patterns in that. Um, but when you refer to the abuse of standards, I see the same in the world of project program management, mm -hmm. um, where people think uh, standards and guides are like cookbooks, uh, which provide you a guarantee to success. And we do that at many levels. Business do with it, chief execs do it, governments do it. Um, what's your idea to that? Are we as humans too much unconsciously active? and think that we can just apply anything as a cookbook? I think that's a, so this is actually one of my favorite metaphors when I have to explain uh, students about qualitative research. I think that, 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 well, say that the difference between qualitative research and quantitative research is the difference between cooking and baking. Because when you're baking, you have to be very precise and follow the recipe to the letter because if you, put ingredients in different quantities or um, you leave the cake too long in, in the oven or the temperature is not right. Like there's, there's nothing you can do. Once, once the dough is done, the cake is in there. Uh, if you haven't done things right, there's no way to fix that. Right. In large. Well, when you're cook, and that's, that's, that's what happens with, uh, with quantitative research often. I mean, once you have sent out a thousand surveys, when well, the old days you had to, now, now you can just resend it again, but <laughs> still, uh, uh, you, you, it's too late when you realize, oh, maybe I shouldn't have asked that question, I should have asked that question. You already sent out, you have contacted your respondents, you got the, the, the responses back. You cannot go back and say, oh, can you please answer this question, not that one, it's, or experiments, think of experiments. Once you have subjects going through, you cannot just adjust things as they happen. But qualitative research is like cooking, it's like you're cooking a sauce or a stew. Mm -hmm. You can always add water or adjust the, the, you know, the, the temperature, add salt, spices, do things that up until the very moment can, can make a difference in, 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 in the outcome. And that's what qualitative research is about. Uh, you have some basic things that you have to keep in mind. You know, then if you're cooking a, 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 a tomato sauce and you burn the onions, that's it. You just thrash them and start again. You know? But apart from that, there's a lot of leeway in, in adjusting and adapting uh, that you, you don't have or you have to a much lesser extent when cooking, when baking, sorry. 
So the idea that I will try to, this is to say, uh, uh, in this webinar, I will try at the same time to show you the fundamental things that should you, you, you need, but also show you the opportunities you have to adapt and extend and tweak right. uh, on, the, on the fundamental template. But I don't know if that answered your question. Your... Well, to, to some extent, because um, very simply, you do not become a chef cook all of a sudden. Exactly. By yeah. following a cookbook. And Absolutely. that's Absolutely. So a lot of time. It requires you 10,000 flight hours, so to speak. And incidentally, the good chefs, when they start, maybe they perform the very same uh, procedure over and over and over again for two months until right. they have learned it. And then they move to the next and then they learn right. to the next. And only then they start combining and doing the bricolage. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Katerina. Nice yeah, just a short question. Hello, David. It's really inspiring listening to your presentation. Um, but I'm curious um, here now about this methodological bricolage. Uh, since I'm a junior researcher, I'm not that much experienced in uh, still like methodological approaches and applying them in research. Could you elaborate more, please, about this methodological bricolage and when do you apply it, like in the stage of research design or in the data analysis? Because um, I think also when doing ground theory and experimenting with um, research methods, uh, because I had like one case when I was writing one paper and I tried to use multi-grounded theory and my co-authors who are more senior, they say like Katrina, you're not uh, trying to do here multi-grounded theory and theorizing cross levels. Because I was thinking like I have so many data uh, like interviews and uh, platform data and uh, secondary data and I could do can do this uh, multi-grounded theory and they told me like no it's not exactly multi-grounded theory <laughs> so grounded theory you should um, first like at, the, at one level try to understand your data and uh, develop the codes etc so but um, so I'm, I'm struggling also with this um, definitions of the grounded theory and multi-grounded theory. Could you also, as a second additional question, maybe explain uh, before uh, methodological um, bricolage? Thank you. So I will go straight to methodological bricolage because I'm not sure what you're talking about, about multi-grounded theory and just I, and my, my methodological expertise is not so fine grained. Okay, okay. I just do Thank things. Um, about bricolage, maybe Ibrat, you can contact Mike Pratt and say that I told, I suggested you to invite him for a webinar because there seems to be appetite about learning about bricolage. I think it would be great. I would certainly be happy to listen directly from, from Mike what he has to say about the bricolage. But having said this, in my case, I think the problem lies with the very question. When you ask is it something that you do at the research design, at data analysis, data collection? The truth is, as I just explained, is that the qualitative research is much more fluid. It's not so strictly segmented so that first you plan and you design your research and then you collect your data and then you analyze your... This is how we explain things in a journal article because there's a genre about no, journal articles, there's a template about how you talk about your research methods. And also because we have to make reviewers understand what we did. And so we, we, we adopt this template so that it's, they're familiar with that and they can understand. But the reality is that you're constantly making decisions about the design, the analysis, the collection, and they are all interconnected. And maybe you start uh, coding your interview data, and then you realize that then there are some interesting insights that they could be actually explored with archival data, and then you do something different. Then you go and retrieve archival data, and you do something different with them. And then uh, maybe you, you, and that leads you to change the kind of mm, claims that you make, that they move from interpretive to more, more objective claims. Uh, and that's something that, at least in my case, it just happens. As I, as I learn more and more about the phenomenon that I'm studying or the case that I'm studying, then I understand better what to use, what data to retrieve and what to do with those data. So it's really driven by my 
increasing understanding of the, uh, the, the, the phenomenon, the, the, the case, and understanding of the opportunities that are available to collect data and to use this data to support and, and development of interpretations of what's going on. Marwa, or... Yeah, hello, David. Many thanks for this very useful uh, talk. Um, thank you so much. I just have a question uh, with regard to analyzing qualitative data, uh, because sometimes I get confused with uh, the multiple ways we use to analyze the data. For example, grounded theory, GIA method, discourse analysis, and all, all of almost all of qualitative ways of analyzing the data. Are, the, are all of them start in the similar way? So we start all, all, um, all types of analysis using open coding. And then after the first step, we decide what we should do according what we have in our data and according how can we best answer our research question that's that's not entirely true. Hmm? That is to some extent true in the sense that the, in my experience, there's often an, an open coding of the data to understand better uh, a general holistic engagement with the data. But sometimes there's a theoretic, theoretically driven coding too. If your research question includes some already established constructs, you may want to code searching for those constructs, trying to find evidence of those constructs. That, that's particularly true in case studies. Uh, whenever you, you want to explain mm, certain yeah, constructs that are already there. So when I studied practice adoption at 3M, well, practice adoption was part of the research question. So we coded for mm, trying to understand how the practice was uh, was adopted over the years, and we had a theory of practice adoption in terms of fidelity, and uh, we'll see it later. And we use this this uh, this particular. Uh, so we we tried to track whether the extensiveness and the fidelity of the adoption of a particular practice had changed over the years, and that was theoretically driven. It was not open. Yeah. Otherwise, by and large, yeah, you're not you're not wrong. In, in the beginning, you start with a holistic, open-ended engagement with the data, and then you develop some intuitive insights and, and, and tentative provisional uh, accounts. Then you try to to uh, to find more robust support for or to uh, try to elaborate. Yeah. Yeah, does it relate to the philosophy uh, we are using in our research? So, for example, it depends on how basically we we do our research, uh, if it is um, interpretive or if it is um, positivist approach. So if it is positivist approach, we know exactly what we are searching for some perspective within the social constructivist approach we know somehow we are we are searching for but what if for example if we are doing ethnographic study and we are going to explore every thing there yes well we'll be guided by we know exactly which kind of analysis we should follow Ideally, yes. Ideally, yes. We should always ensure a coherence between our epistemological and ontological foundations and the methodological choices. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. This is very useful. No problem. I would take, because I, I don't know, we've been here 45 minutes and I haven't even started talking about the Joya method. So I would take a, a couple of questions more and maybe we can move on and there will be opportunity. I'm staying here until every single question has been answered. So uh, just for the sake of, of ex um, expedience, but uh, uh, Subhanjan. Yeah, hi. Uh, hello, Davide. This is uh, Subhanjan from the New Delhi region. Uh, good evening from here. 
uh, thank you so much it's always been a pleasure to to listen to you um i have a question and i have two requests um my question is that uh, when i was listening to you you mentioned that uh, uh the grounded theory approach and more specifically when you talk about the joya methodology uh you defined it as a generating theoretical explanations mm-hmm. of reality filtered through the experiences of the people living that reality i uh, it made me come up with this question that uh, we have when... an interpretive approach to ground the theory i guess this is is uh, seems to be the way in which dennis joya if i understand correctly adopts ground the theory yes uh, so uh in with this uh, perspective uh, is it that the reality is being considered as something which is out there Oh, which is being okay. experienced or oh okay don't let that's how you can start that we have to yes let 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 let's just say that i have a critical realist approach okay <laughs> is that okay okay I think, okay i think that the re- honestly again i, I know that you, there's a, a whole range of possible philosophical ontological epistemological assumptions uh, that you can pick off and uh Personally I agree that we can only understand reality within the the, the 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 mental and linguistic categories that we use to talk about this reality that is partly constructed and uh, but then again we the best thing we the best we can do is to try to to develop to to make sense of what's going on out there knowing that part of what's of what's going on out there we are also responsible for that uh mm. it is socially constructed uh and but then of course sometimes you, you assume that there's some some sort of reality out there whether this reality is socially constructed or is objectively constructed probably it's a bit of both uh right so how, so how do you suggest early catered academics like us to position a paper when we send it out to review don't, don't. unless they okay. ask you Uh, I know I, I know that this sounds I, I, I some people will be horrified by what I'm saying now um, from the the methodological ontological epistemological first of all I don't see this as, as long as you're doing things that are reasonable um there's no need to declare what you do because most people will understand what you do in my case in my experience discussions about epistemology or ontology only arise in in uh, uh uh in the review process if you're doing something that is clearly wrong if you're making statements that are clearly contradictory and then people say oh, 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 let's let's be clear here but like exactly what what are your epistemology because there seems some some there's, there's something inconsistent here but otherwise it's not that if you don't necessarily declare your position people will ask you to in my experience in the journals that i usually work with as an, as a, as a reviewer or as a uh, or as a um, as an editor or as an author so as long as you do things that are kind of reasonably reasonable and as long as you make claims that are warranted by your by the evidence you present mm. As yeah, you, said, yeah. you say it's inductive then so people will say it's abductive you say it's abductive people yeah yeah it, 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 it's endless now the moment you start to uh, enter a discussion of, of philosophy it's, it's because uh, you know uh, with the practical challenge when you get into the gestalt analysis you keep connecting to literature and theory and you feel you are being abductive when joy writes inductive and then it feels like there's still so much yet to understand just, i'm sorry i'm just coming with very basic elementary question and it may seem no no, no I, i understand but to me it's like does it make sense to you and if it doesn't make sense if, if it seems to make sense to you but it that if there are some methodological philosophical epistemological flaws then somebody will point it out for you hmm? if you present your work to mm-hmm. colleagues if you present your work to conferences and you do your best to make it consistent from a methodological ontological epistemological perspective and then somebody if if 
there's some contradictions in there. Somebody will point it out and you will fix that. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And, and okay. maybe they will point it out during the process. So I think that what is important is that whatever is published, it's not internally contradictory or inconsistent. That there's a process where socially as a community, we are able to fix these issues. Mm -hmm. But then there's, there's no need for you to declare it as long as you honestly reflect about what you're doing and, uh, and honestly, uh, so it's, it's more about being mindful of the importance of methodological coherence and epistemological and ontological coherence. That is important. Labeling it, unless they ask you, that seems to be, to me, less important. If they have doubts, they will ask you and you will label it. It's a process. Our research doesn't quite exist until we publish it. If you understand what I mean. It's the social construction that takes place in the editorial process that makes our observations some socially accepted sort of truth. Okay, this was very deep. All right, uh, I need to step in. Uh, we need to move on. Um, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, I, and, and, and really, my, the purpose of this was to give very concrete, practical guidance, and now, yeah. We are talking about um, life, the universe, and philosophy of science, yeah. which I'm really not qualified. As you can tell, this is not really my... No. May I suggest the, the audience to, to, to focus your questions on the methodology, because all those overarching issues like uh, epistemology and philosophical, philosophical stand are really well described in books and articles. Uh, yes, those articles are really difficult to read, all right, so, but it is written, but the methodology itself, all right, so, and the questions indicate that many people don't really understand the difference between open coding and template, template coding, and please, David, can you please focus on, on, on this? In, in I'll be happy to. So, why do I like the Joya method? Okay, why, why do I feel the need, I felt the need to codify this, or why, why did I use it? so often. I like it because first it forces a disciplined approach to evidence. It forces you to really think about, do I, do I have the evidence to back up these claims? It's in the, in, the, in, in the forging of a code structure, it's in the building of the data table that you really have to think through every single statement you make. And I think this is important. This is, for me, this is more important than, than the labeling of more well, the philosophical labeling of what I do, if you go back to what we discussed last week. When working with a data, with a, with a database that mostly comes from qualitative, from interviews, it's, very, it, it, it's a very good way to start seeing some patterns in there hmm? uh, as a first step to, and then, then from there, you may do more elaborate analysis, bring in other sources of data, but it's a very good, first uh, step. Somehow it allows you to prototype the paper because once you have a data structure and you have a data table and you have a grounded model, there's no need to write a single line to figure out whether you, uh, you have a paper. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a way to, um, to, to, not quickly, because it's not quickly, but to, to understand the kind of theoretical claims you can make and the kind of interpretive model you can produce without even writing a single line. Once you have that, writing a paper is usually, I wouldn't say a piece of cake, but in my experience, much more time goes into the production of these three displays than in the actual writing of the paper. Then the actual, once you fix these three things, the paper, I wouldn't say it's written by itself, but it's, it's much easier. It helps you structure the findings and the data display. It gives you a template, some, some clear guidelines about how to write your findings in a, way, in a way that already highlights the theoretical implications of these findings. And finally, and more generally, it helps you clarify how you know what you claim you know. It helps you bridge empirical observations and theoretical claims. And we'll see how. Hmm? Uh, 
when talking about the joyous methods, uh, these I think are, are, are the three um, best existing written references about the logic, the principles, the epistemological and ontological underpinnings. And if you really want to learn more about this method from this perspective, go and look at this and these papers. What I'm going to do today is what these papers don't do. Uh, it's like a very practical step-by-step -step advice. And just to, we already mentioned some of this stuff, but just to clarify what, what, this, what is the, perhaps the essence of this method. The idea of this method is to uh, help you apply, as I said earlier, systematic conceptual analytical di discipline. It, it, it tries to make your analysis conceptually and analytically rigorous. Mm -hmm. To help you move beyond the relatively intuitive and holistic engagement with the data so that your interpretations are more credible because people can see where they come from it, it somehow gives transparency to the process that led you to derive your general theoretical interpretations from the the, the evidence you observed and therefore produce statements that are more plausible and more defensible mm -hmm. Foundations, as I, we said earlier, social construction of reality, and informants seen as knowledgeable agents, as people that know about not all of them. Some are usually more articulate than others, but that they are relatively you know, that they have a pretty good understanding of the reality in which a socially constructed reality in which they operate. And by interacting with them, you are able to gradually produce some relatively general and transferable understanding of a particular social phenomenon. The purpose here is to learn from a specific case to develop some more general theoretical understandings. That could be in propositional form or not, and process, process more. Okay, now, if you look at it, and I will use Corley and Joya 2004, because that seems to me to be the archetypal mm, paper in which this methodology was adopted. The first step is usually establishing a timeline of events. What do I mean by a timeline of events? Something now clarifying possibly even with a, with a uh, figure, what happened out there and how and when did you engage with the phenomenon? Just to clarify, mm, how close you were to the things that you describe happening actually happened. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a way of, of, of helping people understand the, the change process that you're starting. This is, a, as we will return to that later, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a method that applies very well to study change process, things that happen over time, and to position yourself within this general timeline that you start. The next step is, as we mentioned, open coding, meaning that it's not driven by some more general theoretical uh, understandings, but trying to let uh, uh, an, an understanding, an interpretation of what happened emerge from the very interpretation of the people that you interact with, that, that were immersed in that uh, phenomenon or in that change process. And the idea is to move from first-order codes, informant-centric, to second-order codes or themes, research-centric. This is very important. This is a distinction that not many people understand. So the, the, the big difference between first-order codes and second-order codes is that first-order codes are descriptive. They are relatively uh, easy to understand even from the, even for, for the informants themselves. It's a description of what happened largely in the, the words of the informants themselves or in words that are easy to understand for them. The second order codes, they group these descriptive first order codes into more abstract, analytical, theoretical codes. This is usually the language of academia. Hmm? Uh, and the data structure shows this progression. Hmm? This is a data structure. Now, if you notice, 
and can you see the my like the arrow here the first order codes are all relatively descriptive they capture the reactions the responses the uh, the questions that were raised by the spin off of this organization and you know, loss of parent company as direct comparison we lost well, we, we lost the parent company's direct comparison. We shifted our focus comparing with competitors. The attention of the media shifted away from Bosco. This is all descriptive. You see there's, there's precise references to the, the case company itself. This is what they kind of heard from the informants. How do we get from here to there? Or this is what independence means. This is still a description in the words of the informant. The second order themes are more abstract. Change in social reference, temporary identity discrepancies. This is the language of academia. If you tell one of your informants at Botsko and say, after the company was uh, spun off, there was, now you lost your, your parent company as a direct comparison. You started focusing more in comparing yourself with the competitors. And you notice that the attention of the media shifted away from your company to the industry. And they would say, yeah, yes, pretty much that's what happened. If you tell them after the spin-off, there was a change in social reference, they would go like, sorry, what? They wouldn't immediately understand, or they may not immediately understand, because this is the language of academia. Second order themes, these are the conceptual building blocks for the grounded model. The shift, the, the, the transition from first order concepts to second order themes is really a transition between a descriptive representation of your findings, still in the language and in terms easily understandable by your informants, to a description of your findings that is meaningful for scholars because it's theoretical. Now, imagine. Uh, a data structure, you can imagine as a way to tell an increasingly parsimonious story about your observations. If Kevin and Danny had wanted to tell us what they saw happening in the, uh, in the, at Botsko after the company was spun off, they could have given us, given us 500 pages of transcripts and say, look, read this and you will understand everything. And we would, hmm? but that's a lot to ask. So they could have actually written uh, um, maybe a, a 100 page or 120 pages detailed history of what happened. A little less to read, very accurate, very rich, but still a lot with a lot of details. Or they could have decided to select some of the most insightful quotes and say, look, read these 50 pages of quotes and you will understand. And there's still a lot. Or they could try, they could have tried to distill the meaning from those quotes and, and, and capture the meaning into first order concepts that altogether help us understand what happened in a relatively parsimonious way because we could tell the story, instead of telling the story of the spin-off at Bosco in a 120 page case history, we could say, well, after the company was spun off, there was a loss of parent companies, direct comparison, there was a shift in focus to comparison with competitors, media attention shifted away, people started asking where we're gonna be, how we see ourselves and so on and so forth. And that's still a very detailed, but relatively parsimonious account of what happened. Or they could tell us, you know, after Bodsko was spun off, there was a change in social reference, there was temporal identity discrepancies, and there were construed external image discrepancies. This caused some identity ambiguity, which triggered a sense-giving imperative for the managers. You see how this becomes even more parsimonious. They're still telling us what happened, but they're telling us in much less empirical detail. They just grasp the... the the theoretical essence of what went on. Or they could be even very parsimonious and say, well, 
After it was spun off, there were some triggers of identity ambiguity, and then depending on the change context, other things happen. This is just part of the data structure. So you see how the data structure is really, an, and, and the coding process that leads to this data structure is an attempt to capture in increasingly parsimonious, increasingly abstract terms, your empirical observations. And these arrows are not causal arrows. This is important. This is a common mistake. These arrows don't mean that the loss of parent company is direct internal comparison, shifting focus to comparisons with competitors, media attention shifting away, caused a change in social reference. They are a change in social reference. Change in social reference, temporal identity discrepancies, construed external image discrepancies, they did not cause identity ambiguity, they did not cause triggers of identity ambiguity. They are triggers of identity ambiguity. See, this, this, this is very important. This is the, the essence of what open coding means and what it means to, to build the data structure. Okay. Now, the next step, but actually it happens at this, you, you see it later in the paper, it happens at the same time. As you do this, you collect systematic evidence to support your codes with evidence, with robust evidence. This is data tables. You see social reference change, temporal identity discrepancies, these second order themes, they are shown here with selected evidence that shows you where they come from. And now here it's the, the evidence is organized by second order theme. Now this is because perhaps uh, once you, once the paper gets accepted, often reviewers tell you, good, now we, we, we understood, we are reassured, we know you did your, 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 your analysis well. Now we have these very, very, very long tables. Shorten them, streamline them. And then what do you do? You remove first order codes, just have some selected evidence for second order codes. But this is not what was needed to convince the reviewers. It's always dangerous to infer from a published paper that that was sufficient to convince reviewers. Because uh, in this, mm, uh, for instance, whenever I submit a paper that uses this method, I have very long tables where I submit two, sometimes three, depending uh, also on the space, quotes to each for each first order code not second order codes. Hmm? So each first order code supported by at least two, sometimes three quotes to show robustness. Okay. And also to give the possibility to the reader to actually go through the evidence themselves. So makes sense, makes not. A, you, you want to give them the possibility to challenge your analysis. This is what transparency is about. Then of course, the published paper may not be a paper where half of it is just tables. So, Usually they will ask you to streamline it and then maybe you will have one quote. And because by then you have already reassured them that there's enough evidence and then your interpretations are robustly supported. Okay, we'll return to this data table. Now, what happens is that the second order themes, usually, usually the second order themes are used as building blocks for the grounded model. Remember, you know, uh, here, the second order themes, changing social reference, temporal identity discrepancies, and so on and so forth, we find them again in the model. Social reference change, they slightly change the label, temporal identity discrepancies, construed external image discrepancies, and so on. Not the first order codes, not these ones, not these ones, the second order ones. Why? Because it's the second order codes that are the building blocks of the model, that are the concepts that you use to build your model. The data structure shows you where these concepts come from uh, uh, by connecting them to first order codes, descriptive, which are also then, you, you find them in the data tables. So the data tables is where you show empirical evidence for first order codes. And the data structure is where you link this first order codes to the, the descriptive 
empirical first order codes to the theoretical second order codes. This is how you show that your theory is grounded in your data. Hmm? Uh, Pascal. Hi, Davide. Thank you for this. This is very, very helpful. One <laughs> question that I've kind of always had <laughs> with this is that, so the second order themes are what comes across into the model. Yes. And when I look at these tables, it's almost like it's always the, the same level. There's the same number of levels in the hierarchy, let's say. But sometimes I have trouble going, okay, what is the larger aggregate dimension from the second order theme? Like, I, you know, maybe there's not one or maybe it's the same thing. So, so you, you don't necessarily need an aggregate dimension. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that later. Okay. But you need at least two levels. You need yeah, yeah. a theoretical level and a theoretical level. Sometimes you find it useful to group the second order constructs, themes, call them as you will, into broader conceptual areas, mm -hmm. the aggregate dimensions. Occasionally, very rarely, you may need a fourth level. It may happen, but usually it's three, sometimes two. And two is enough. You don't, if, if you don't feel the need to uh, group them into, into aggregate dimensions, you don't really have to, as long as you have the second order themes and you use them to build your model. Mm, okay, that's very helpful. I had no idea about that because I was always thinking that, yeah. See, yeah, these are the things that they don't tell you. Mm -hmm. And so just to follow up on that, um, I've never seen a published paper though that, uh, imagine if you had this and you had aggregated the triggers, but then that construed external image discrepancies you had no larger thing to aggregate that. So you wouldn't ever publish a model that has some things aggregated up and then some things just hanging around at second order? Uh, you wouldn't. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't because somehow we all need harmony and symmetry. There's an mm. internal need of, no, even we have also as reviewers for symmetry. So. Uh, whatever we do that somehow uh, disrupts that symmetry is likely to raise reviewers questions. And that's why you try not to do that. But sometimes okay. I oh, felt the need case. sometimes to, to take, but. In that case, you just kind of probably would say, no need to aggregate higher. We've already gotten up to the second order of the theoretical or level. You, you find ways to unpack your ideas differently and. Okay, okay, so perfect, you, thank you so huh? much. No problem. Guillermo. Yes, hi, thank you. Uh, I, uh, regarding this slide, is it fair to say that there is a zero order coding where you do the line by line in vivo coding and therefore this first order concept is already a pre-screening of that line by line in vivo coding? Yes, if you do that, that if you do it that way, yes. Uh, I don't necessarily do it that way. Um, I will show you some, but um, for me, it's, it's, it's a mix. Uh, but yes, often first order concepts are already some kind of uh, merger of even more specific in vivo codes or line by line codes. Yes. Thank you. Sudhanshu? Hello, Professor. Uh, I have a question. I mean, sometimes you have first order concepts which can be broad enough that it falls within two se within two uh, different second order themes. Then you made a mistake. Then you then made we a mistake. Shouldn't happen. Shouldn't happen. Okay. Thank you so much. I will get to that later. So I will then show you where these things come from if we manage to get there in time. But uh, so I would say last question for the moment, Ravi Karn. Oh, hi. I, I just want to know because now sometimes I have a problem to code uh, second order themes because sometimes my supervisor said that the theme is not really interesting. And I also have three research questions. So I, I just want to know how do you code and title it? So I, uh, I think that that's a good question. Mm, often we, we start uh, at some point and we have more codes that we really need. And, and, and with, a, with a case, especially if it's a complex change process, there's a lot of things going on. 
And not everything is necessarily relevant to your research question. You can decode it anyway in the beginning, and then you realize, but that's not quite, and so you eventually eliminate it. And that's, that's the, 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 the final, the selective coding, if you will, the, where you trim and prune your model for the weakest codes or the codes that are less relevant. Uh, so. Okay, shall we go on? Okay. So then finally, once you've done this, the other important, other important element, the finding section. The finding section maps exactly the structure of the framework. So if this is your framework, you will need sections that are like triggers of identity ambiguity. One, two, three. Identity change context. One, two, three. So. Because that's how you help your readers navigate your data structure, your, your, your model, your finding section. If you have a model that is organized in a certain way, and then your finding section is organized differently, readers are confused. That's simple as that. And so uh, I think it's 95% you know, of the times, maybe 100, but I don't want to be too directive. Let your finding section, the, the structure of your finding section, mirror the structure of your model with some exceptions, and we will see some of them, but there has to be some consistency because otherwise your readers will be confused. And, after, and what you do as you narrate your findings, you will use what Mike Brett calls power quotes, hmm? the most insightful, the most uh, rich and, and, and the strongest quotes you have, you put them in the narrative, and then in the data table, you put additional selected evidence. You do not put the same quote in the text and in the table. Because why would you? Hmm? The idea is to show that you have robust support. So if you're using the same quotes here and there, it's like saying, I don't have enough quotes. I'm so like, forced to use the same quote in both, uh, in both parts of the paper. It's like admitting that your, your analysis rests on shaky grounds, so you don't do that. Mm -hmm. And then there's a separate section that is either usually, not always, but usually the last part of the findings or the first part of the discussion or a separate section in between where you theorize your model. Theorizing meaning that you guide the reader through the model and you explain the model. You tell the reader how the model works in present tense, not past tense. Findings, they are narrated in past tense. This is what happened. That's what, what you saw happening. That's what you heard. Hmm? The model, present tense. This is your theory. This, this is where you try to generalize, to, to, to develop theoretical arguments that are transferable. And that's where you use the present tense so that it's not a description of what happened, but it's an explanation of the mechanisms that made it happen, of the processes, of the constructs that were involved in that. Mm -hmm. And finally, in the discussion or in the rest of the discussion section, you will discuss the theoretical contributions. Next week, incidentally, we will, no, not next week, two weeks from now, so the next webinar, we will talk about how to write a discussion section to highlight your theoretical contribution. So if you're interested, there's going to be one more way to talk about that. Okay, now, where does all this come from? Because this, this I gave you the anatomy, right? I said, hey, this is the various components. How do you produce those? Huh? And Dennis Joya says, you get no data structure, you get nothing. So he placed emphasis on data structure. To me, it's one step earlier. So to me, everything starts with the data table. And, and that's what I'm telling my my co-authors or often the younger co I talk to students, like, unless we have a data table, we don't have a paper. I'm, I'm not even starting to write a paper until we have a data table. And yet the, the, the data structure is implicit in the data table. But the, the data table shows you what constructs you have and reassures that you have the evidence to back those constructs up. Now, the next question then is how to put them together in order to produce a model. But I need to make sure that I have the building blocks, I have the, the grounding of these theoretical building blocks 
before I start writing a paper uh, without knowing if I have evidence to back up my claims or not. Hmm? So how do you produce a data table? Uh, well, usually I, I, I don't use any software, okay? I, the software I use is Word, not even Excel. Everything has to go into Word at the end. So there's no point in, if it works for you, it's great, but I don't see why you should start coding in Excel or because everything has to go into Word tables anyway. So I usually read every text, I interview transcripts or, or archival data. Yes. And just highlighting relevant fragments and taking notes, tentatively assigning some labels, hmm, descriptive labels. I may already have some theoretical labels at this point. So uh, as you will see later, um, yes, it's bottom up, but it doesn't start really at the bottom bottom. No, I don't do line by line coding. I try to code for like maybe set sentence fragments or, um, uh, and sometimes I code, I start grouping around second order codes and then I unpack them later. It's, it's more like a starting in the bottom middle and then working your way up and down until everything kind of works. It's an iterative process. And usually I, I go back and reread transcripts after the first patch. So there's recoding because sometimes you, you notice new things in light of what you read later. And maybe, uh, especially if you didn't do some of these interviews, because otherwise you kind of already, if you've done most of the interviews, you have already developed some interpretation by the time you actually go and, and code systematically. But if some of these interviews is the first time because you, you, know, you divided up your work in the research team or whatever, uh, then I think it's important to just do this recording. And, and by the time a paper is published, I may have read and reread and reread interviews several times because every time you kind of notice things different. And then how do I build a data table? Well, after I've read a lot of transcripts, I Sometimes, in the old days, I used to cut and paste all the relevant fragments and put them all in a separate file and then work on that file. But you don't necessarily need to do that. Maybe I just paste all the transcripts into a single file, 50, 60, 100, 120 pages long, whatever it is. And then I start manually grouping fragments and moving them into tables. There's no, I don't use NVivo, I don't use Atlas DI, I don't use any of these things. I, Maybe because I, I, I've always done this and it works for me. Uh, I never felt the need for a software that would not really do the analysis for you and may even crystallize your labeling. I, I, I find it important for me to actually engage manually, you know, cutting, pasting, moving things around. It helps my brain absorb the data and see connections is this discipline engagement with the data. And usually I tend to have separate tables for this broader overarching dimensions that seem to be emerging. So you can see that this, at this stage, I, I intuitively have some ideas about what the big themes are, the, the bigger, broader themes. Uh, it may change, but uh, it's a way to start organizing things. And then in each table, I, for, I have rows for second order themes. And then in these, rows, I have a first column with label and a definition. And then the second column, I gather all the fragments, all the fragments grouped by first order codes. And this is how I try to make gradual sense of, of the meaning of the data, the meanings that, that's, that's in the data. Hmm. While I do this, I sometimes come across some interesting parts of interviews that are not really, you couldn't really code them. They don't necessarily refer to a specific code, but they may hint at dynamism around codes, hint at relationship between codes, possible explanatory mechanisms, things that are important for my theorizing. Remember, these are knowledgeable informants. So we assume that they contribute to construct the reality they experience and they have a, and, and their interpretations matter in the unfolding of that social reality. So 
uh, I usually set these aside, often pasting them next to tables where they may be that they may be relevant to, and I use them later to um, uh, to inspire theory development or to support my arguments. And this is an example, just randomly picked example of a working table, and you can see that there are second order, well, at that time, I would, I would call them concepts, codes, uh, some labeling, some tentative definitions, reflections. Here you can see, maybe I may have multiple labeling there because I'm not sure yet. Uh, and here, if you notice, I haven't made the first order cons, I, we, not together with the colleague I was working with. I haven't quite, we haven't quite uh, articulated the labels, the first order codes yet, uh, but that's because that's what you now they might have been in the manual coding, but by the time I'm putting them in, I'm trying to still keep things fluid and not let myself constrained by the very first label, which I think it's the, the, the biggest risk with, uh, with, uh, with the software, at least what it was when I tried, is that they crystallize your initial labeling. So you're retrieving, you're, you're, you're counting, but still it's that initial labeling that is kind of stuck, you're stuck with. Well, this is more fluid, it's more emerging. And ideally you should end with something like this, where you have the second order codes, you have a label, you have a carefully defined, con remember these are constructs, and is a part of your model, so you need definitions for those constructs. And then you have first order codes with their um, evidence that this is simplified version. Normally, I would have all like there's a master table where for every single first order codes, I have five, six, seven, ten mm, fragments that support that particular code. This is very important. You should always have a master table that you go back to, and then you decide what to do with these codes. And while I'm building a master table, I use color codes. That's maybe because I'm, I'm a visual person. And so this is just an example. I would highlight in green the power quotes. So these are the quotes that to me are the, the most insightful, the, the, the best quote to tell the story where the, the constructs comes out more clearly. These are the quotes that eventually, in my mind, are going in the text, in the main text, in the narration of the findings. Gray is the opposite. These are the less powerful quotes. Those that um, maybe it's not so clear, or maybe it's like it's a, there's a lot of text to make a point. Like these are the quotes that eventually I will remove from the table because in the end, when you submit it, you don't need more than two or three quotes per, per uh, first order quote. Blue, these are interesting quotes that I have to keep them in, but I'm not sure they go there, but I'm not sure where they go. So it's more like a, something to be relocated. And this, I also use it in the paper. I have some paragraphs when I, when I highlight something in blue is like, this has to be in this paper, but I'm not sure whether it's here or the, set, the, the research setting or discussion or whatever. And finally, I use yellow as a general purpose labeling, like this needs attention for whatever reason. It's underdeveloped or something like that. This is what works for me. And uh, maybe you, you find, the, the reason why I chose these four colors is because you can actually read while like you can still read what's, what, what's I highlighted other colors in, 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 uh, in Word, for some reason, they, they seem to obscure completely what's the, the text. So that's it. Francesca, you have a question. Hi, Davide. Hello. Thank you for this. I always learn a lot while listening to you. So uh, my question is, I've often found that when moving from first order code to second order code, I might find some concepts that are new or I think are new to the literature to whom uh, I would provide the definition so that I would define. And some other concepts that are not actually new. So some concepts that were in the literature before, because I mean, we, we all might observe things that other people have observed. So my question is, should I discard all of this or should I also keep no, no, things no, no. not new and just avoid to define them? 
No, absolutely. So I remember Dennis Joya once saying that when we're, when, when we're doing a qualitative study, like 70, 80% of what we see has been described already. Okay, so we already have words. We already have concepts to describe that. And it's the, the, the 30% that it's new that will make a difference between something that is published or not. No. But if some elements of your model are well known already, well established, it's okay. No. As long as it's relevant to explain the, the overall framework, you just keep it in and you don't present something that is well known as new just by uh, feeling this internal compulsion for novelty. Mm. Uh, I don't see that as a problem. Thank you. Okay, so basically, like, I can use things that were already described by other people just by obviously citing those people. Yes. And then what's important is that I don't kind of redefine what's been already defined by exactly. somebody else. Exactly. But and this, that I don't claim that this is part of what I what, what my contribution is. Correct, correct. And the okay. contribution may be connecting concepts that were previously unconnected or showing how some concepts that we thought that were connected in a certain way are actually connected in another way. These are important uh, in theoretical contributions. It may not be, not, it's not necessarily the concept itself that has to be known. And, and grounded theory is very clear that there's a, when they talk about navigating between theory data and the literature, it means that you are, your labeling of your emerging observations also keeps the literature in mind. And sometimes you go to the literature and find labels. And sometimes you come up with your own labels. That's, that's, that's perfectly fine. Thank you. There are other questions. And, uh, I don't know, Svetlana. Yeah, uh, Davide, uh, this is Rahul uh, here from India. I, I hope you can hear me and see me as well. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm not, I was not able to raise my hand for some reason in the software. Yeah, so my question was uh, something around the, uh, the structure, the data structure that you had shown on the Joyer's paper, uh, yes. where you moved from first order to the second order and then to the aggregated dimension. But my question is more from the first order to the second order. Like, I feel like it's a straight jump. Uh, like I, I couldn't really kind of get a grasp on, uh, you know, how did we move from, let's say, some of the, uh, you know, the larger descriptive version of the code, the first order code, to let's say something like identity ambiguity uh, or uh, change for that matter. I mean, it seemed like a sudden jump and I wanted to uh, know like if there is something uh, it, like a secret sauce in between or what's the connection or how do we make that link? Of course, some of the things became clearer as you started explaining, uh, you know, how you do your tables. Uh, but I think it would be helpful uh, if you could kind of put your thoughts on that. Thank you. So there's always an element of abstraction, okay? It, it's, it's about finding a more abstract concept that encompasses the empirical observations, okay? Right. And, and that's, that, that's perhaps the, 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 it's not a creative leap, but it's a conceptual leap. Like it, 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 it's a process of abstraction and categorization of, of finding a more general category that you can use to keep all these things together. Like something that grasps what makes these, uh, these particular um, statements, these particular observations, these particular labels kind of similar and related to one another. Mm. So the, the abstraction is a process that is based, I think, in, in, in also in terms of a comparison um, right. among the, 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 the lower order codes and seeing, okay, what keeps them together? Why do I feel the need to group them together? What do they mean to me so that I feel the need to keep them in the same there's right. also so an element more, of, uh, of more intuitive then rather than from the literature. I mean, I thought it, it was something like you have to, you know, get it from the literature as well. Or is it something more intuitive? Let's say, is it something like you're coining depends. your own term while it, building your theory? Is it like that? It, it depends. It's like Francesca was saying earlier. Uh, sometimes we already have right. concepts, words to label what we see. Sometimes we don't. And then it's up to you to propose a label and a definition and to persuade us that that label and that definition is appropriate for, for the, the, 
the evidence you have. That's why, uh, as, as a reviewer, I always go and carefully check all the data tables because I want to see whether the interpretation of the, of the authors kind of makes sense. It's like, okay, wh where do these ideas come from? And I go and say, okay, would I label them in the same way? And sometimes maybe I would have a slightly different label. It's not a big deal. And sometimes like, I'm sorry, I don't see why these things, you label them that way. You need to explain it better because I don't see the connection. And, and if, if there's that response, it's a problem. Right. David, I may I step in? Um, and yes. Otherwise, guys, if you have a question related to the coding, please keep your hand up. If your question is on more general topic, please keep those uh, those questions to the Q&A session. All right. So, Khalid? Hi, um, thanks for the session, much appreciated. Um, my question is with regards to um, second order um, second order themes. So they have to be literature centrally have been um, in the research paper. Should it uh, be displayed in the? Is, should it be in the appendices or should it be within the structure of the um, of the write up? And the data table, as you said, is just basically examples of quotes. So basically uh, second order themes and just showing examples of uh, first order um, uh, um, informant uh, centric uh, quotes, right? It's first order codes. You show how first order codes grouped by second order codes are supported by a reasonable number of quotes. Yes, you're showing the groundedness of the first order codes in the data. And okay. your first question, the, the, the sound was not particularly... And so I missed basically, basically, the second order themes or concepts, uh, do they have to be terms taken from literature? So, so no. should we... No. Okay. No. Okay. 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 So, so just basically themes, just, just from my observation, from my... Some um, may be already yeah. existing in the literature. Some may come from the... Uh, they be in, inductively or developed from the bottom up. Yes, your own labeling okay. of your observations. Okay, and then when you mentioned about the phenomenon, so basically the first step in your process, you should, said that it should be, uh, we should basically identify where in the, where the phenomenon takes place within the, uh, and within, what if, what if it's a static event? For example, I'm looking at the internationalization of family firms and then the strategy of firms in my country, I mean, you know, with regards to internationalization. That's so not static. To... Internationalization is a process. It's a process, exactly. Yes, exactly. but I cannot really spend too much time on Thanks. specific... Okay, sure. And just and one last one last point is just you mentioned to one to one of the ladies that uh, basically you, you, we cannot label um, uh, first order the first order um, uh, and informant interviews into two themes into two we cannot uh, basically one first order um, you know uh, term cannot cannot be um, coded in in two two themes that is that is wrong you said right it should, yes, you should only. Correct. Okay, okay, because I've, I've done that, so I need to probably, thanks for that. This is something wrong. So if you feel the need to do that, it means that probably your uh, first order codes are ambiguous. They are too broad. It's not, it, sometimes you see, uh, whenever you have an end, then it may be that you have two things in there. And then that's why you feel the need to connect it to two different codes, because your first order code is trying to capture too much. Then you disentangle, you, you unpack it. Part of it will be connected with one second order code, part of it will be connected with another second order code. Because second order codes group first order observations. Okay, so I need to unpack it then. You need okay, to unpack you. it there, most likely. I don't know because I haven't seen, but that's, okay. that's usually a common problem. Miron. Okay. Let's be considerate. One question from one person, because you know, other other people probably have also interesting questions. Please, um, please stay in. Yes. The okay. Let's yeah, let's so say I one see. question from Miron, and then we move on, and then maybe Shubhanj yeah. and Ravikar. We can all like there's, there's be, there will be time for questions and answers later. As I said, 
I'm staying here until everybody has had their questions answered, but but not necessarily in between. Miro. So uh, if I'm, you know, I'm right now. I'm in the process of writing a um, grounded theory paper, and I was kind of um, uh, felt a bit worried about what you said about not getting into the writing before the um, um, before the data table emerges, um, because I feel like a lot of the writing is about kind of developing the constructs and the data table as I go along. So maybe if it could... helps you, that's great. Certainly, mm -hmm. writing may help you do that. If it works for you, that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, Personally, I prefer to get to the point where I have a, a fairly good idea of what the data table will be, and then I would start from it. But that's a, that's a personal preference. Mm -hmm. But how do you get there to the point where you know what the data table would be just by code? Exactly the way I'm explaining right okay. now. Okay, thanks. Coding and building the data table. And then at some point where I have located pretty much all the relevant evidence, I have a good understanding of what, and then it will be revised as I'm, once I start writing the table, I will keep revising the data table and it's a constant iteration, but usually I prefer to have a fairly good idea of what the relevant content elements will be and how they move together and that they are all solidly backed by the data. Okay, fair enough, thank you. So this is also important. Because when I'm doing this, I'm constantly checking the content of the rows, the content of the cells, questions that you should always ask yourself. Is this label really the most appropriate for these quotes? Do these quotes really fit this label? It's a, con it's a face validity check. As I was saying earlier, if an external reader, me as a reviewer, comes in and says, I don't see a connection between these quotes and this, then you have a problem. So, you need to say intuitively people need to see that yes, this is this label grasps the content of these quotes very well. And sometimes it's a matter of streamlining the quotes, removing some content that is not necessary. Or sometimes you have to give context because the quote in itself may mean a lot to you, but the person who reads that that lacks your understanding of the concept context may like, how do you connect this with that? I don't see that. So it may be sometimes you need to write more, sometimes you report more, sometimes to report less. If I see a row that is getting a lot of quotes, and then I start thinking, well, do they all really fit together? Do I have this overwhelming, vast support for this very single idea? Or are there opportunities to regroup some of these quotes and develop more uh, fine-grained uh, second-order quotes? Each of them supported by four, five, six different quotes. And so teasing out uh, differences in the, in, the, in the evidence. Or alternatively, if I see some rows where there's not much evidence, it's like, what do I do here? Uh, am I really splitting hair here? I'm trying to capture too subtle a, a meaning to be widely supported. Maybe there are opportunities to merge and develop broader second order categories. So you see, it's really a, a process that constantly moves up and down until you reach a feeling of order. It's like, okay, now everything kind of makes sense. There's every uh, label is clearly defined, supported by, con that by quotes that mm, clearly relate to that. And, and, then you can, and then you have a data structure. Then once you have that, you have all the ingredients for the data structure. Now, we already mentioned some, of, some important uh, kind of unwritten rules about the data structure. Let's just make sure to, to, to clarify. As I said earlier, usually there are three levels, but sometimes it's two. And because two is what you really need, you need the empirical and the theoretical to show how you move from the empirical to the theoretical. Quotes go into the data table. The data structure shouldn't show quotes unless you're using them as in vivo labels. Now, in theory, yes, you could have an enormous table that, an enormous figure that shows a data structure and then you keep going and for every first order code, you show a lot of quotes. Yes, but that will probably take a lot of space. And you're kind of asking the same 
display to do two things at the same time. The data structure shows the map of your codes and shows where the abstract codes come from in terms of the, the, the empirical codes. The data table shows evidence, selected evidence for the empirical codes, the first order of codes. Two different functions. Keep them separate. That's my suggestion. Hmm? Occasionally, you see displays that try to do multiple things. If it worked for them, great, but it may be confusing. As I said earlier, each lower order code fits into one and only one higher order code. And each lower order code corresponds to at least two, usually no more than three or four, lower order codes. If it, it, you shouldn't have one first order code feeding into one, one second order code, because it's like, okay, but if it's one and one, like what, why do you feel the need to have different labels? Uh, or, or then the theoretical the labeling may not be so robustly grounded in the data. So my suggestion would be try to unpack the empirical evidence a little better so that you have at least two or three first order codes for every second order code. Okay. When I'm saying no more than three or four is because sometimes when I find five, six, seven first order codes associated with a single second order code, I often see opportunities to unpack that and say, actually, here you have more than this. Your second order code is really too general. And there are opportunities to, to be more specific, more fine grained, hmm? have a more granular, granular theorization of, of the phenomena. Okay. As we said already, first order codes expressed in terms that are descriptive, still easily understood by informants, second order themes. Theoretical, analytical. And as I said earlier, the data structure shows how theoretical constructs are grounded in the data. It's, it's, it's th those arrows signal aggregation. It doesn't show theoretical relationships. It doesn't show causal relationships among constructs. Okay. Now, having said this, you might come across one of my earlier papers and say, whoa, whoa, whoa what is this? You call this a data structure and you're exactly doing all the things that you say that we shouldn't do. That's right, we shouldn't have called it a data structure. This study was not doing the Joya thing. And we kind of found this visual display useful to help readers understand where the, uh, the theoretical constructs came from in terms of all the various empirical observations that we had. Um, and there were some empirical observations that supported multiple constructs. So we used this and it worked. The reviewers found it useful. I wish you not call it a data structure, that, that, that's misleading. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the, the, the data analysis was very complex. We had a table that was just showing every single analytical step, clarifying what did we do? Why did we do it? What data did we use? And this is something that I think it's really important for every step clarifying, you'll see it highlighted in yellow, analytical outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, you see analytical outcomes, you see that for every step, figure one, table three, table four, table. This is very important when you have complex, this is case studies, so complex qualitative studies that have multiple steps, multiple sources of data, uh, dividing them in steps where each step has a clearly identified output that shows you how you gradually move from a general chronological reconstruction of the process to a more specific theorization of some elements of the process. That, that is something I always found very useful because sometimes readers can get lost, but if you show them Every step had an output. Here are the step, here are the outputs. Then you look at all the outputs and you understand how I moved from one to the next, to the next, to the next, moving from data to theory. Okay, this was just a digression that I thought it might be useful. Now, there are also other ways of, you know, of like the, 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 the form of the data structure that I showed you is the most classic ones, but, this is an, an example from a, an older paper of, of mine with my uh, former doctoral student, Ileana Stigliani. Uh, this was a doctoral dissertation. Uh, we had 
coding that converged from two different sources of data. We had her own field notes. This was an ethnographic observation. And, and, and also we had transcripts of 50 plus interviews. And we used different data sources to capture different elements of the process that then converge into a, a general understanding of the sense-making process in designers' work. Uh, it's a data structure. It's just that it, it looks like it's a double entry data structure because it shows convergence from two different data sources. Looking at practices on the one hand and, and, and cognitive processes on the other and showing connections between practices and cognitive processes. This is a more recent example where it's a rare case where we were using a, a, a coding, like an open coding, like Joya-like open coding uh, to show variants. It's rarely used. It, it's not designed well to show variants in the data. Uh, this was a, an attempt to, to show how the, pro, the, the change patterns that we observed, they, were, they could be described in terms of the same categories, identity reflections, enactment, and enforcement, and what they meant, but they were manifesting differently in different cases. So this was a way to, to show how uh, the, the variance we observed was underpinned by the same data structure. Just to show you that it's not so rigid, but you have to, to apply it carefully and mindfully. And, and then there are you know, opportunities to adapt these fundamental moves or techniques to the particular uh, characteristics of the project. You might call this an example of a bricolage. Grounded model. Now, how do you move from a data structure to a grounded model? The idea is to use all these elements and recombine them into a process model, most usually, uh, most commonly, uh, sometimes a variance model, sometimes a mix between process and variance, or rather showing a different, showing variance in the way processes unfold. But, so how do you do that? Now, what is, how, how do you do this creative leap? Now, to do that, I think it's important to, uh, what, what is a theory? And I think that, that uh, Kevin Corey and Dennis Joy in an article about theoretical contribution, they summarize it in a, in, 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 in a, in a useful way. You know? We could debate for hours and hours about what a theory is, but we could, it's a, a good working understanding of a theory is a, a statement of concepts and their interrelationships that shows how and why a phenomenon occurs. It's some concepts and then some ways in which these concepts are connected that, that help us understand how a certain phenomenon happens. And of course, not everyone will agree with this definition of theory, but this is a definition of theory that is consistent with the use of this particular method. And if this is the case, then the problem you have, how do you build the theory? Then you have to, you need, you need to build the ingredients. You need the what, the concepts, you need to the how the interrelationships, you need the why, an explanation, an explanation of, of why these interrelationships operate this way. What, how, and why. Where do you get the what, the how, and the why? Well, to some extent, I start building this, this model or, or, or fragments of these ideas already while I'm coding. Already, remember, while I'm coding, I'm writing definition in the, of the second order themes. And this is the what. You know? I'm theorizing the building blocks of the model, the concepts that will constitute the basic building blocks of my grounded model, and define them, labeling and defining them. And doing this in the, uh, directly in the table helps me make sure that whatever definition I give, it captures the content of the empirical evidence that I'm trying to to, to express. It's some sort of content validity if you allow the transposition of this evaluation criterion from positivistic research. Is, is, is making sure that, that the definition of your concept, your constructs, covers the evidence that they are supposed to express, measure, represent. This gives you the what. Now, how do you get to the how? But the how to me is really 
visualization, if you remember what we discussed last week, uh, it, it, it help, it, it's very important. Because to me, it's really about intuitively drawing connections between these constructs that, that the, the coding is, is providing me with and tentatively hypothesizing, if you will, some connections that then I will go back to the data and analyze the data more systematically, the narrative, and see if, if it fits. Hmm? The last step is the why, is an explanation. Hmm? While working on each table, sometimes I just write chunks of theory explain, explaining the relationships. Like it, it's, okay, I see things moving together. Why would they be moving together? Let's write some things down. Hmm? You could call it memoing. Uh, and I write maybe half a page, a page, that just to crystallize some ideas about how some of these concepts that I see in the tables are related. And then all of these then become um, pieces of, my, of, of, of the section on the grounded model, where I then put all these things together and I try to explain why things happen the way I represent them in the, in the model. Remember, this is the part that you write using the present tense, is the general explanation of the model. We'll return to that next week also. And this is something that happens already while I'm coding. Like this is an example of a, of a transcript that I was reading and I was coding, I was highlighting, and I was already hypothesizing you know, some possible connections and this is what may be happening. Just bits and pieces that then eventually they, they you know, uh, all get together and they form the grounded model. And sometimes in the back of transcripts, I can start taking some, you know, some theoretical developments. Here I was trying to see if there was some, if I could arrange the practices that we were observing in a way that, uh, like mapping them along different dimensions. You know? exposure versus manipulation of artifacts, artifacts as embodied thoughts or embodied experiences. These were tentative labeling. It eventually didn't go in the paper, but it reassured us that there was some theoretical underpinning to this descriptive uh, classification of practices. Mm -hmm. The idea is that you will constantly review your grounded model, making sure that you use all the constructs from the data structures and only the construct. Hmm? Usually you focus on second order themes. All the constructs have to be used. Otherwise, what, why do you need some of those if they don't end up in the model? Hmm? And only those that are in the data structure, you, you shouldn't then throw in stuff that is not in your data structures because otherwise the reviewer is confused. It's like, well, where do they come from? Remember, the data structure shows you where the building blocks come from empirically. And if, they are, if, you, if you can't find elements of the model in the data structure, it goes like, well, where, where, where is the empirical connection here? You may have contextual conditions, triggering events, some of the stuff that you discuss usually in the research setting part or in the first part of the findings. But ideally, the, the core elements of the model, they should all come from the data structure. Then you have to, again, test it against your empirical narrative. Is it a plausible explanation for your observations? Mm -hmm. The most powerful, no, the higher explanatory power, remember Harley and Cornelison. Does it fit all the cases you have, all the incidents? Is there some apparent contradiction out there? Can you, how can you explain this contradiction? It's like, this is where you check the, the explanatory power. And then you write what I've mentioned already in the past, a three, four page description and explanation of the model. Abstract, general, like it, it's, a, it's an account, it's an explanation of how the model works that doesn't say, oh, doesn't refer to, to your empirical observations anymore. You have to be able to explain your model in three, four pages without ever, ever a single time referring to your empirical observations. That's the only way in which you can claim its transferability because otherwise it will still be presented as a description of something that happened. But how do you know that it is transferable? Something useful at this stage is try to use this model to explain something similar. Say, like, well, I applied, I, I developed these ideas based on, on my case, 
Here's a similar case. Would my ideas help explain what happened there? Yes, no, why? For me, this is absolutely essential, absolutely essential. Because it really, that's how you test the transferability. That's how you test whether what you've done is simply a very accurate, interesting, historical explanation of what happened in a particular case, or you have developed a more general theory. Hmm? If that's your ambition, obviously, and this is what this model does. So this is about applying the Joya method in terms of how to do it in practice, or how I do it, actually. Not how to do it. I'm, I'm sure there are other ways, and maybe Kevin and Danny and others, they apply it in different ways. This is how I, I do it. When did I find it most appropriate? Single case studies or multiple case studies with literal replication, meaning that you're using multiple case studies to support a common set of, um, uh, a common framework. If it's comparative, if you want to explain variance, that's Eisenhower for you, okay? It's a different template. Process models. It usually works well with you know, showing models that unfold over time, like explaining, uh, understanding phenomena that unfold over time. It's not variance models. Variance models, it doesn't quite work well. Hmm? Focus on concepts. This, this, um, uh, this method allows you to identify interesting novel concepts. It's less useful for uh, articulating causal relationships or causal mechanisms, if you will. Hmm? And of course, it, it, it's better used uh, if you're interested on building your model based on your informant's interpretations rather than on factual observations. If that's your, what you're aiming for, then maybe a traditional case study is more appropriate. Although there may be opportunities to use some of these moves, these techniques for this purpose. Okay, some useful tweaks. Some, and, and I'm almost getting to the end. Huh? We've seen already double entry code structures to show converging observations from separate data sources, showing robustness or showing conversation con con convergence of different types of insights. Double entry code structure or tables to show comparative observations across cases. You wanna show how the differences that you observe actually refer to the same set of analytical categories that were developed inductively, abductively, whatever, bottom up from the uh, from the, mm, the qualitative data you have. Hmm? You're showing how you build this framework, the, 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 the analytical categories that you use to compare cases, you build it from your data, and then you're showing how they manifested differently in different cases. When doing multiple cases, usually first quarter codes tend to be a little more analytical. Hmm? So when, when using multiple cases, uh, you do something like this. Uh, you may have, mm, here you may have second order uh, codes on the side, historical imperative on action. You may have first order codes that are already quite analytical, perceived obligation to act in continuity with the past, preservation of intertemporal consistency. But that's because uh, you need to, to merge um, first order codes, descriptive codes that come from different cases. Cases may be kind of different, but still you're trying to grasp what is common. And so it is not unusual to have more broader analytical categories there. Finally, this is tricky. This is done a couple of times. One of the problems you often have is if you're having a process that is iterative, same steps over and over, you have a problem. Are you presenting your data chronologically? Hmm? Or are you presenting your data theoretically, showing the various steps of the process model that, that cycles? Hmm? Uh, and, and, and because if you organize by phase of these cycles, you're highlighting this empirical narrative, which makes it easier to follow. Hmm? but then you kind of lose the theoretical dimension. If you emphasize the theoretical dimension, then you're showing how each phase happened uh, 
uh, how each step of the process happened, phase one, phase two, phase three, second step, phase one, phase two, phase three. So it becomes, it's clearer the theoretical framing of your analysis, but the chronology gets messed up. And this is something that I've, I've encountered this problem at least three times. So here's an example, just to clarify, and this is the last example in Jesus is late. I, I could speak forever, but you may be tired. This was a study of the implementation of Six Sigma at 3M. And the first, um, and this was the, the process model that we had in the paper in the first submission. And the reviewers came back and said, this is not one reviewer, especially reviewer number three. It's also reviewer number three. So this is not, uh, uh, this is not a scientific research. This is a case history. And we thought, like, oh, what do you mean? Like case? But then we realized, like, yeah, all right, of course. There were things in these supposedly theoretical models that were empirical. No? We were labeling the phases in empirical terms. Some elements of the models were referring to empirical observations. That's like, oh, yeah, you're right. Sorry about that. No? We had a data structure that somehow the second order themes captured how different elements of the model manifested in phase one, phase two, phase three. So the implementation of the practice in phase one was coercive adoption, in phase two was normative extension, in phase three was flexible adaptation. Cultural fit, phase one was restricted use of traditional cultural resource and so on and so forth. So we were trying to use the second order themes to show how these fundamental constructs manifested differently in each iteration of the cycle. And we had a data table that were organized. We had themes, second order codes, organized by phase, so very chronological. And reviewers said, where's the theory? We see it's a great story, but where's the theory? Uh, important, this is the triangulation. We were having quotes from interviews, quotes from subsidiary, quotes from headquarters showing how there was robust evidence from the headquarters at 3M, the subsidiary that we studied in, studied in more depth, supporting each element of the code. This is triangulation. Second submission, the chronological part was completely gone. Now this is, the, now this is how this model works. There are various cycles through these fundamental constructs, implementation, experience of dissonance, experience of practical implication, organizational culture. And we organize the findings like this. We say implementation changed from here to there to there. Then the cultural fit will change from here to there to there. And uh, this was a data structure that somehow unpacked a little better cultural dissonance, but that's not important. Then the data were organized differently. We were still having second order themes, but instead of organizing them by phases, aggregate dimensions, we were organizing them by, so we organized by overarching dimensions, not by phases. And then we had a narrative summary, if you remember from last week, that was showing the reviewers, all the codes, all the second order codes, organized by phases and by overarching dimensions. This was a map of the findings. You wanna read them, Horizontally, you can see what happened in every phase chronologically. You read them vertically, you see how practice implementation changed from phase one, from phase two, from phase three. How leaders and skipping efforts changed from phase one, from phase two, from phase three, and so on and so forth. If you have this kind of research design, this is a very powerful way to clarify the content of your findings and then write the findings accordingly. The text changed. In the first submission, it was organized by historical phases and reviewers were like, okay, it looks like a case history. Second submission organized by constant. It's like, well, but now we, we don't understand the narrative anymore. So third submissions, we had first level heading, findings. Second level headings for historical phases. We had phase one, practice adoption, cultural misfit. Phase two, phase three. Then the third level headings for each phase, we had the core element. So for instance, implementation, faithful and extensive adoption, sense giving, strong and consistent effective efforts, cultural misfit, experience of cultural misfits. So we were highlighting that each phase had the same conceptual structure. It's a little complicated, but if you have if you're working with something that has the structure, you will see how this 
will help you a lot. This was the process model where we still highlighted the, um, the fundamental constructs. And then we use this theorization of the arrows, one, two, three, four, five, to show how the cycle, cycles moved from one constant to the other. Now, to conclude, what are the fundamental risks to avoid? First, overlooking variance among informants. Data tables are designed to highlight similarities, commonalities, not differences. And sometimes it may be that you have important, interesting differences among the interpretations of informants. And the risk is that if you, if you use it in a, in a formulaic way, you will not be able to highlight this variance using these displays. You will, you will need to change them in a way. Just have a table that organizes the, 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 the variance uh, according to the particular elements that shape the variance, whatever. I mean, there's, we can talk about tables some other time, or if you go back to last week, there's reference to, we talk about tables and there's reference to a paper where we show the kind of tables that you can use in this. But the point is, this is a model that is designed to generate process models. And you can use it to, to investigate variance, but it has to be adjusted and you have to do it mindfully and consciously. And this may not be the best way to. So whenever I have variance, I use tables, purposefully designed tables, not Joya, okay? Overstating the individual perspectives. Now, the, the, the selective disclosure of quotes should not allow for models built on anecdotal evidence. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that the point of this is not that you have an intuitive idea based on a few conversations and some perhaps more persuasive, articulate, charismatic informants, and then you just uh, cherry pick some quotes here and there to put them in a table, and you're fine with that. Mm -hmm. You just have a, it's a shortcut to building a table or building a data structure. You have to do your job properly. The open coding process that, that, that we mentioned er earlier, the gradual building of data tables, the gradual organization of evidence, the gradual reflection on, do I have enough evidence to write this stuff? Hmm. So don't confuse writing a paper with doing a study. Writing a paper should, be, should come after doing the study. Hmm. After, like right? start after you start. Mixing factual evidence and informants interpretation. Just because someone says something, it doesn't mean it's true, okay? So this is a, a is a method that, as we said earlier, it foregrounds the interpretation of informants. It's an interpretive uh, perspective. And you have to be careful. And be careful not to somehow pass informants' interpretations as if it was factual evidence. You can use informants' interpretations as inspiration to go and collect additional data and say, this is what they think, this is what they they, they told me, and I went to check, and actually there's, there's some, some evidence to back that up. But don't confuse informants' interpretations with objective. Don't, don't make objective claims based on your informants' interpretations without having collected additional supportive evidence, I would say. Focusing goes on a model rather than a narrative. Like visualization is important to support the theorization. But the visualization should not be the end. Oh, I have a figure. There's no need for me to explain it. No. Explaining the figure, theorizing the arrows is absolutely important. And, and just because you have a hard time representing in the figure, or maybe it's not in the first step, it doesn't mean that you should. That, OK, then it's, then it's not important. No, no, you have to keep working between figure and narrative until the two things are aligned. And finally, again, the purpose uh, uh, is to understand the phenomenon, not to write a paper. You, know? you shouldn't confuse the two. I've seen people that confuse you know, filling a table with some quotes just so that they can put them in a paper and write a paper about it. With you know, The first point is to really understand 
what's going on or what went on in a particular uh, change process or what's going on in a particular setting. And then based on this deep intimate knowledge that you have acquired, then write a paper about it, okay? Uh, the tables are the means to achieve this deep understanding. They're not the end of the, they're not the, the, the final purpose of the analysis. We're not analyzing data to produce a table. We are producing a table to understand the data or the phenomenon more generally, okay? And that's what I've got. And I hope this was uh, useful. And it's like two hours and there's still 200 of you here, so I'm flattered. Please, any question now? Thank you very much, David. Um, um, you know the drill, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. Please um, keep to the format one question from uh, one person and uh, um, please keep your questions related to the Joya methodology, not something else. Uh, if, I, if I may, uh, I kickstart the session with a question from chat um, from Anshul who is unable to raise his hand. Um, and the question is really easy. If we have more than one source of um, information, for example, an interview with CEO and his uh, uh, post on social media, do we do anything differently in this case uh, related to the coding? Well, probably yes, because they different sources of data, they may really uh, be evidence of different things. Hmm? So uh, posting on social media, you could argue that that's a, a way in which a CEO is trying to project an image or express an identity. You know, there's the, it, it's data that is produced in a particular context and therefore that text has a different status than the text that is gathered in an intimate conversation with, with, the, with the scholar. So uh, you have to be careful not to mix what is it, apples and oranges? Hmm? So I don't know if that answers the yeah, question. Yeah, that, that helps. Um, I think there was another interesting question from a person who are already left, have already left the, the chat. And the question was, if we have more than one coder, and I think in your projects, uh, it, it was the case, how do we address the consistency? And so what do we do in this instance? Well, I always preferred as much as, it, as long as it's possible to, to have my own separate coding. And then we, we discuss at some point, maybe it's a separate coding only on part of the evidence. But uh, uh, personally, I like at, 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 as long as it's possible, uh, eventually to, to, to have the most comprehensive reading or independent comprehensive reading of the data. Um, and ideally, what we, we would then compare our own interpretations. And generally, there is a, some substantial overlap. We may disagree on the labelings, the wording, but by and large, if we had discussions about the data and sometimes doing interviews together, and there is some convergence there. And this agreement is usually resolved by me saying that I'm right. And I'm <laughs> no, this agreement is resolved by discussing and, uh, and you, you eventually find an agreement. And also in light of the data, you always go back to the data and, and, and say what, what might capture better this particular uh, piece of evidence. Right, great. Thank you very much, David. Um, there are many hands raised. I don't remember. Yeah, who some progress to the, to the hands. Uh, Ravikam, I think, uh, yes. is the first. Can I just make a suggestion before we carry on? Uh, David, could you please stop sharing your slides so we can see you better? Sure. Thank you. That's true. Good. Oh, hi. Can I ask you, uh, because you already told us about you, Define the concept on the second construct. So I just want to know if you define on the aggregate level as well. Or I mean, do you define um, the concept on the aggregate level? 
I define concept. Ah, uh, I, I certainly define concepts at the second level and third level. If there's an aggregate dimension there, obviously the first order codes are usually descriptive, so they don't need to have a, uh, a specific definition as long as what you're showing in the. Uh, they should be self self evident, self explanatory in a way. Um, if you feel the need to explain why you're labeling certain uh, certain um, pieces of evidence that way with first order codes, then you have a problem. Then it means that you have probably chosen a code that is too removed from, from the empirical evidence. Yeah, uh, can I ask one more question? Because sure. somebody told me that after you- No, you cannot. Please, uh, shall we stay? One <laughs> ah, come on, it's one question, Sergei. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so <laughs> much. Yeah, be because somebody told me that after I do the coding, I have to go back with the existing theory to find a new theory to explain. I, I just want to know whether the existing theory um, helped to explain in the second order level or at the aggregate level. I'm not sure. I, a theory may be useful or may not. Uh, existing theories, general theories, may be useful to articulate the mechanisms, in my experience. Hmm? That's something, something that we discussed uh, last week when I introduced this concept with the idea of retroduction in a relatively uh, lighthearted way. But that's, that's, you bring in general theories to help you understand how the concepts relate to one another. That may be a useful way to bring in general. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. Who's next? Serena. Hi, uh, I just have a quick clarification uh, about the number of coders. So do you recommend having one person code all the transcripts and documents? Well, for sure, there has to be at least one person that does all the coding. Ideally, mm -hmm. ideally even more than one, well, two. Uh, okay. Two people who do all the coding. Hmm? Two people who do all the coding. Ideally. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Ideally, you should have uh, two people that do all the coding or one person. Or, or certainly there has to be an overlap, mm -hmm. a substantive overlap. And so that they kind of um, uh, can compare their own codings, can discuss. And, and sometimes... The second person may do a, some, a combination of random and selected coding, meaning mm -hmm. randomly picked interviews plus what the other person says, look, these are the most interesting ones. Mm -hmm. So there's, you're sure that you're, you're going through what seems to be the more the richer, but at the same time, you're randomly picking stuff so that there's no risk that uh, uh, the selection is biased by the first coder. Uh, and then maybe you will have a third person reviewing. If you have a third okay. author reviewing the, the emerging code structure and data. Ideally, though, the ideal mm -hmm. is that at least two people read everything and code mm -hmm. everything. That's what. And, but do you need to report intercoder reliability or? Absolutely not. That is mm -hmm. something that doesn't make any sense with this. With this. Um, I think that's, a, that's an interesting story because one of my uh, in early paper, uh, uh, one of the reviewers asked for intercoder reliability. And it's like, it doesn't make sense. But what if the reviewer asked and the editor hasn't said anything? So we recruit uh, doctors, students, postdoc, and we, we find some intercoder reliability, calculate everything, 82% or whatever. And then at the second round, and another reviewer goes like, what are you doing? It's a code reliability. It doesn't make any sense with this kind of research. And the editor said, actually, yes, yes, you're right. It's a code reliability. Mm -hmm. Go there. Sorry for not noticing that. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. So, Thank you very much. No problem. Alicia. Hi, do you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. So uh, the model you presented, um, with the identity, context, identity change context, isn't specific to the case, but is it 
transferable and how do you make it general because when you have a single case study or more Sorry. Uh, what more like mm, Corley and Joy yeah Sorry Corley and Joy's model Yes this one uh, this Yeah one? Yes <laughs> How do you make it transferable It's if you believe Yin, for instance, is analytical generalizability. Hmm? Uh, models built based on a single case study are made general, generalizable by uh, theorizing, providing a theoretical explanation for what happened that could explain similar things happening at the same time in similar circumstances. Yin has a fairly positivist way of looking at things. So, Transferability actually comes from Ruben Lincoln. Ruben Lincoln, really, about transferability, what I understood from Ruben Lincoln, it's, it's fairly reasonable. It says, look, transferability is not a problem of the author. It's a problem of the reader. It's a problem of the reader figuring out whether what they're reading applies to whatever portion of reality, social reality, whatever, they're interested in. And so what matters is the maximum transparency and, transparency and richness. Uh, how do we make our mm, models, our theoretical interpretations transferable? By being as detailed, rich, transparent as possible as the context, as all the conditions that may affect the capacity of our insights to be applicable to other contexts. Now, I usually try to do things in between these two extremes. I try to offer a theoretical explanation, as I said earlier, describing in general terms, so that you're saying, you see, I'm not trying to explain this particular unique case, but I'm trying to develop a more general uh, explanation that could possibly apply to similar circumstances. Then I try to give examples of transferability or of trend, trends, of transfer actually, by taking some ideas from some of the core ideas from the model and saying, for instance, if we look at this other case, this other phenomenon, and it may come from past studies, we could interpret this, uh, we could interpret this in terms of, uh, of this model. Like this is how the model that I have developed or the theoretical ideas that I have developed in this paper can help us understand better these other studies that were published in the past or this other case that we all are familiar with. So I'm trying to do something in between. I don't know if that was clear or helpful. Yeah, it helps. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Khalid. Hi, once again, I just have a question with regards to, uh, um, first of all, thank you so much, David. So informative that the session has been. I would add, my question is, is there a limit to the number of aggregate dimensions that come out? No, no, there's no limit, uh, but there's some, some kind of cognitive, limited cognitive capacity that we readers, reviewers have when processing your model. If you have a, uh, 37 second order codes grouped into 13 overarching dimensions, your model will be extremely complex and very difficult to process for your readers. So, so is there a sweet number? Maybe uh, maybe seven, eight, or no? Uh, you can get away with three or four sometimes. There's no, there's no sweet number. It, it is what it is. It is what, what, you're, what you need in order to explain your... Uh, your uh, your observations. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you, Pascal. My question is actually kind of similar to that. I was wondering about, uh, it's always a struggle with the length of the paper um, and getting, getting what you want to say in paired with the quotes. So is there a number of power quotes you recommend using and then just tabling kind of the rest of them or? So I'm trying to have roughly at least one power quote for every first order code, roughly. Sometimes no, sometimes I may have two, uh, but as a general rule of thumb, 
you don't want to have some codes with five quotes and some codes with nothing. Hmm? Okay. Usually for every code, I try to have maybe a paragraph of general descriptions, maybe some short excerpts and then a big quote. Hmm? But you have to be careful because if you're too mechanical and you just write your findings as a sequence of codes, uh, of, of codes illustrated, then it becomes kind of boring to read. You have to, to make it a little dynamic and narrative. And, and you just do that, make sure that you are somehow going through the various first order codes grouped by second order codes, maybe using subheadings to highlight the second order codes. And, um, and then having at least one quote for every first order code. Sometimes two, sometimes none, but by and large, mostly one. That okay. I think balances the richness and the space limit. Then of course, this is just some general rule of thumb. So your very best quote, power quote, put that in and then in the table, you bring out the, even if there's a kind of other power quotes still just have them in the table because-, because I mean, if, if I have, I try to put in all the power quotes I have. Okay. Uh, not not always. I mean, so it, again, it's a it, it's a it's a matter of balance. Sometimes you realize that there are some very good quotes, but you have already you have three very good quotes that pretty much say the same thing. So one is enough. Okay. Thanks so much. No problem. Thank you. Next question is Efe. Hi. Thanks, Agi. Uh, thank you, David, for the you know interesting and useful session. If I may, um, what software do you use in constructing or visualizing, you know, your Word. data structure? Sorry? Word. Word. That's interesting, okay. I do everything with Word. Right, thank you. Yes. You can do a lot, eh? you, can, you can do a lot. And everything goes into Word in the end. It's a Word document that you produce. Oh. That's interesting, thank you. No problem. Great, thank you. Bruno? Bruno, you're muted. Uh, it's a question which is related to the question about power quotes and also about the risk of overstating individual perspectives. One question, Bruno, which one? Sorry? One question only, which one? Oh, I'll tell you one question that's related to these two topics. Just yes, just, 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 just say it. Yeah. Um, how do we do when you have a lot of interviews uh, mm -hmm. maybe one pro quote, quote, quote for something and a dozen of these 100 interviews which speak really about your topic. Do you cut the data or do you just um, and write a paper about these 10 interviews which speak about this issue? Or you do, do you take the whole coding of the whole interviews and, um, and explain that among these 100 interviews only 10 speak about this issue that you are writing this paper about this issue? Well, no, I, okay, I understand what you mean. So, first of all, you don't need all interviews to support every single second order code. It is normal that, especially if you're studying some change processes in organizations, some people may have been part of some phases and others may have been part of other phases. Some the, the middle managers and, and, and the top managers might have had different perspectives on what was happening. So. That's not, no, it, 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 it is normal. Also, uh, sometimes you, since you constantly adapt your interview structure, it may be that some people didn't talk about something just because you didn't ask and you didn't have a chance to interview them again. So um, some insights might have emerged later in data collection and maybe some people you could go back and ask for a follow-up and others were no longer available. So that's fine. Uh, I think that what matters is that uh, as a whole, those interviews make sense. So it, 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 it made sense for you to investigate this particular phenomenon through those to that set of interviews. Okay, and then not everybody necessarily talked about everything. Uh, as long as there was no contradiction there that you are somehow sweeping under the, the, the rug. Uh, if there's variance, you have to be open about that. Like only some people 
believe this. Other people have a different view. And, and, and then you have to ask yourself, why is that? How do I, how do I explain these variants? Hmm? Thank you. No problem. Great, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it is possible that we have some questions from the YouTube translation, Ibrat. Um, no, I haven't, I haven't uh, looked at the YouTube translation because um, we have a lot of questions here, I think in the, um, in the room. So let's, let's take for now. All right, so then um, Huben Subhanjan, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you so much, uh, David. Excellent presentation, helps a lot. Uh, again, I have a very basic question for the coding. Um, uh, I'm sorry if it's a bit dumb, <laughs> but um, I read somewhere that when we are trying, when we're doing the coding to come up with a process model, uh, the second order themes needs to be labeled in the form of gerunds. Is that true or uh, it's completely misplaced? I mean, no, no, no. I, uh, that, that's a pet peeve of mine. Because sometimes you see all this ink, 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 and it's forced. It's like, ah, okay. yes, it's true that, that the, the, the gerund makes it more dynamic, but it shouldn't be, you know, especially whenever you have an ink, then you have to specify who's doing the ink and who's the subject of the ink. No, that there's, uh, you, you can see when it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a mind, like a, it's a reasoned choice to express dynamism. And when it's just, a, again, a, a, a template, a formula, it's like, oh, it has to be in ink. Like then everything is in ink. Uh, don't feel forced to do that. Hmm? Right, right. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Help. Thank you. The next is Joyce. Hi, um, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Okay, um, first of all, I want to um, just maybe help me clarify a small thing. So from the first order themes, they seem somewhat brief compared to what probably the interviewees were saying in their statements. So are these what the researcher interpreted because it's just like a single line different. The second order themes, yes, are the the, in, the interpretation of the researcher okay. expressed in theoretical terms. Okay. And the first order codes are the, the codes that show the, the, it is what shows the transition from the raw data to the theoretical interpretations. Okay. This is, this is what this model is about. So you have to be careful. Sometimes you see uh, this model, this template, you see these data structures where the second order codes are empirical, descriptive. It's like, no, that's, that, that, that's not how this thing works. This works as long as the second order are theoretical and the first order are empirical, because then you show how you transition from the raw data to your theoretical model. If you mix things up, or if everything is theoretical, or if everything is empirical, then it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Okay. I think that shows our, contribu our contribution as researchers. Then another small thing I want to ask is, um, the way you present the figures and the conceptual models from all your data and your findings is really creative. So my question is, are some of these figures uh, adaptable? Like I can say, okay, adapted from um, this paper or, because I don't know, uh, it comes with time. I mean, the art of creating beautiful. Yes. Yeah. There are, so if, Again, if you go back to, no, we didn't say that. The, last week we mentioned about the role of, of visualizing in theory. Uh, yeah. I have a paper with, with, um, with Anne Langley, right? She had, like, she's really the lead author on that paper where we try to, uh, to show some templates for figures. Mm -hmm. and, but the truth is that every, every study, every merging model would probably need something different. So. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting question, and I see some of my some some younger students or colleagues that I've noticed that they try to use some of the figures that they have seen in my papers and adapting them, but it doesn't quite work well. Like every model is different, so I there are some. There's Maybe, maybe there's, there's certainly room for doing more in terms of visual templates. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Your turn. Hi, David. Uh, thank you so much. Very informative uh, uh, presentation. I actually clicked um, a couple of areas that I had difficulty in my data and, and study. So I asked a question about that part, which is probably what you call tweaks or hacks of the original uh, uh, GeoS model. Um, and I love that. And it's the, 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 the challenge that I have is that when we want to capture uh, chronological data, the phases, and as you said, it brings complexity. Does it make sense now to make it a four-layer uh, coding, not one, two, and three aggregated, but a fourth layer? And in the first one, capturing the, the, the time-wise. For example, I'm studying effect of technology and organizational identity. User that I interviewed in 2016 saw it some, tell me something in the quote, and in 2018, she's telling me something else about the perception. So they are in the same category but one of them is expected this variable, this, this concept, and the other one is the emerged one. So in the first order, I'm trying to capture the time and eventually be able to show it. And it's becoming four layer, it's becoming long, but does that make sense? Maybe, maybe not. So uh, the data structure, at least in its original version, is meant to have a, a, a linear, gradual aggregation of codes. You're grouping empirical descriptive codes into increasingly abstract and uh, analytical codes. But it's just one classification, one dimension. What you're saying is I have the same data that I could possibly aggregate by time or I can aggregate by whatever other log, like I can, by, I, I could have a theoretical aggregation or a temporal aggregation, if I understand correctly. Now, these yeah. are two intersecting uh, criteria for aggregation. It's the same thing. You can group them by time, by phase, or you can group them by the core theoretical elements of the model. This is the problem that we had with 3M. So we had to make a choice because if we, you cannot show both of them in the data structure because the data structure goes one way. Hmm? Then that's when we used the narrative structure because the narrative structure allows you to show the, 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 the crossing of the chronological and the theoretical. And then the cells are the second order codes. And that allows you to group the second order codes by uh, theoretically or chronologically. But you need a table for that. The data structure, it, it's linear. It goes in one direction. It's the table that allows you to, to have two dimensions. The data structure is unidimensional. If I understand correctly what your problem is, but maybe your data are different. And a... No, absolutely. You hit on the nail. Thank you so much. No problem at all. Thank you very much. And we have uh, Katarina with another question. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Sergey. Uh, sorry for asking additional question. Um, so uh, my question is on the process model that David has shown. How do you combine chronological and theoretical uh, grounding? At which stage and when are the struggle? And when there are struggles, how do you resolve those? Okay, again, you, you keep thinking in terms of stages. Now, I think it, these, these things evolve. You realize at some point by comparing your data that actually, uh, so the temporal bracketing in, in our particular case, in the 3M case, the temporal bracketing was suggested by, um, by the informants. Several informants say, you know, first there was a, when it comes to Six Sigma, there was a first phase where things were going a certain way. And then somehow there was a second phase where things changed. So in that case, it was suggested by, by informants and we tentatively applied that. And then we, 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 we figured out that we could use this, a, a, a core set of analytical categories to explain how things change from one phase to another. The Bang & Olufsen paper back in 2006 with Mike and Schultz then the chronological segmentation was inherent in the data in a sense that we were comparing uh, identity 
reflections in three different occasions, like they, for three different time, in three different um, periods of time, Bang and Olufsen said, oh, who are we really? So well, there were three projects and the temporal bracketing there was inherent in the data rather than suggested by, by the informants. Um, that's probably how it, when you have this multi-phase iterative, that these are probably where the, the temporal bracketing comes from. Okay, thank you. No problem. Great, thank you very much. And the next in the queue is Indo. Hi, David. Uh, my question is like when you have different entities, um, let's say we have data from founders of maybe like an accelerator or an organization. And at the same time, we have employees or entrepreneurs who are in that accelerator and they are different entities at different levels, but they are all trying to achieve something similar. So do we need to have a data structure that's split? Let's say left-hand side, we can have a um, uh, data structure that's coming from the founders and the right hand side, we can have it from employees or entrepreneurs. And at the center, they're kind of uh, presenting something very similar, like reaching towards a common ground. Is that the way we should approach it or uh, just like a normal data structure pointing towards that common theme? I don't really know. It depends on the theoretical insights. So uh, are these, um, these informants somehow pointing to this converging, like they, their interpretations of their own reality. Is it converging? Are they using the same categories, the same mm, mental structures to understand what's going on there and to interpret this social reality they're immersed in? If that's the case, the fact that they are in different positions doesn't necessarily require you to, to, to have separate data structures. But if they have different interpretations of their social reality, and, and you can then, then maybe, then the Joya model is not the best way. Then maybe it's better to have a, a table that somehow use rows for, the, for analytical categories that help you articulate these different views. Then you will have, uh, see like top managers, employees, and whatever are the three different groups. And then you have to look at the data and say, okay, in what ways do their views differ? Hmm? They have different goals, they have different assumptions, they have different performance criteria, they have different whatever. And then you use a table to show these differences in a sort of narrative format. And maybe you can have some little narrative summary for every cell and then every cell having two or three quotes as examples. It's that's perhaps the best you can do if that is what you are observing. So it's, it's difficult to say do this or do that because I, I don't really know what is the emerging observation, what is this theoretical interpretation that is coming from the data. Can I give a small example? Let's say uh, entrepreneurs are seeking funding and Accelerator is helping them connect with the funders. So they are both basically reaching at the same point, like facilitating resources. Okay, then, then in that case, if facilitating resources is the aggregate dimension, then you can have uh, or the second order code, then you can have different entry points from the different, uh, from the different uh, sources of data. Yes, you can do that. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you very much. And the next on the queue is Mars. Uh, hello. I see in one of Joya's papers that he talks about concepts and constructs. I can see in your data structure, you've got uh, constantly talk about concepts. Where in there we get to constructs? I use concepts and constructs uh, interchangeably. There is some uh, uh, some terminological proliferation there has been. So um, I'm trying to to follow Dennis Joy and stabilize on first order code, second order themes, overarching dimensions, and concepts being 
the concept slash constructs being the, uh, the second order themes. But in the past, I, me and others have used some of these interchangeably. And yeah, that's unfortunate, but that's why I'm saying that we need more codification rather than less codification of templates. Uh, you did talk about dimensions uh, and other papers, they have a different view of dimensions. What do you mean by dimensions? Yeah, some papers call overarching dimensions or aggregate dimensions or aggregate themes. Okay. It's just a second level, a second more abstract level of aggregation of theoretical codes. Okay, great, thank you. No problem. Thank you, Mars. Um, Ibrat, you're the next in the queue. David, um, last week you talked about the necessity of explaining the arrows. Yes, theorizing the arrows, yes. Theorizing the arrows. Um, presumably we don't need to code the arrows, but how do we explain them? Well, that's what I, what I tried to explain last week. You, ex you, you explain arrows in terms of more general theories of organization, of cognition, of motivation, of in whatever it is that we accept as a reasonable representation of social reality. Now, so if we accept this, whatever it is, it's institutional theory or it's a um, cognitive theory, one of the many cognitive theories or a cultural theory, sense-making theory, if we accept this as a reasonable theoretical lens, then we can explain this interaction in these particular terms. Hmm. But we don't need to do any more than that, do we? Because of COVID. Well, that, that's, already, mm, that's already a lot. Uh, but you, you need, to, to me, it's like providing a reasonable explanation of why those two things are related in that way. It can be a Temporal relation, causal, recursive. It's an explanation. It's like, what, what does that arrow mean? And why do you expect them? Well, on, on what basis do you expect them to be linked that way? And either you bring in a, a, a theory, like, well, if you accept that, not following institutional theory, you expect that we accept that people. Uh, that actors in a field are subjected to isomorphic pressure, then we can explain this in these terms. Hmm? Or you can have a, a, a persuasive, sound, logical explanation that says, inspired by the data, perhaps, and this is, this is how you explain what you saw, and people may go like, yeah, makes sense. It's Thank you. As simple as that. Not simple. But, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brad. Uh, Shan Yan, you are the next in the queue. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, Davide, thank you very much for very useful tips. Um, you, I really appreciate you talk about uh, the frictions between temporal aggregation and also the theoretical aggregation. And then in the beginning of the seminar, you mentioned six steps for the anatomy. So let's say if we strive for theoretical aggregation using the Joya method, is there still a need or what is the role of step one of um, teasing out the timeline? Yes, yes. That to me is absolutely essential. Whenever you're working with, with change processes or events that happen through time, the very first thing is get the chronology right, regardless of the it's joy, it's case, it's case study, whatever. Get the facts right. Make sure you have an understanding of what happened, when, who did what, and and and, and that would probably help you already identify possible phases, possible segmentations. But uh, yeah. Mm, often I, in the past, I, you know, I, I asked what, what I did myself, I, or I asked my students to write a 50, 60 page chronology of the case. And sometimes it becomes a case, uh, a teaching case, uh, but it, it's really helpful to make sure you, re you really get it right. And then you start theorizing. And I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, thank you very much. So it's kind of like a way to familiarize with the data before the actual theorizing. Absolutely. That's exactly what it is. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you, Shen Yun. And the next in the queue, in, in the queue is Mahina. Uh, thank you, Professor. 
it was very detailed explanation of the method can you please tell me if i am trying to observe a phenomena suppose customer churn uh, and i am trying to observe it from inductive reasoning as well as from deductive reasoning can i use this method deductively no 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 inductive inductive yes so so that is fine if i use on one hand i use this method on the other hand deductive reasoning that is and bring them together on a single model that is i don't understand so you're you're asking if you can combine this with a deductive model yes so suppose there are some findings from inductive uh, reasoning yes uh, some constructs has been formed and on the other hand literature is also suggesting some constructs can i can i combine them in a single model yes absolutely so uh, if some of what you observe has already been described that's okay that will be part of your model like it, it's not that unless every single piece of the model is new then you have to trash it a lot of what you observe has been described before we have been studying organizations for 100 years maybe a little less maybe more depending on where you place the start uh we know a lot about organizations and people and social interactions and cognition so yeah chances are that we already have words for some of some of what you said and, and what if most of the constructs are already defined but relations the arrows are uh, what i am observing from inductive reasoning the arrows are changing so that is, is that, that may be an interesting observation that that's no we will um we will talk about it next week um one of the ways to claim a theoretical contribution is to say you know everybody thinks that a and b are connected this way but actually my study shows that a and b are connected in a different connected in a different way than we thought Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. This is crazy. We've been here for three hours. Yeah, for three hours. Thank you. You, you're very, you've been very patient. Yeah. We are Assuming you're there, of course. Assuming these 80 people are still there or they're just maybe watching Netflix like my students do and, and then claiming that I didn't say <laughs> certainly, certainly we are not watching Netflix here. We, are, we have approached the, the, the end of the queue and uh, if I may, I, I want to ask you, you a question. So uh, certainly your Cornelison is, uh, is a great um, a scholar and, uh, yes. and methodologist. So the notion of methodological bricolage, you know, so yes. Uh, what is your perspective on uh, pragmatic cherry picking from Joya methodology? Because I, I might be mistaken, but uh, uh, at one point Joya said that you either apply that in a holistic way or you don't apply it in the uh, at all. I've seen a couple of examples of, uh, uh, for example, people stopping at the data structure and claiming that this is the theoretical contribution or people do, doing um, uh, Joya, saying that I'm using informed grounded theory, which is essentially axiomaron. All right, so, and my supervisor gave me a great adv advice. He said, Sergey, don't innovate on methodology. That's gonna save you time on your PhD project. So what would be your perspective on this? Those are wise words. So, uh, Yes, I agree with Danny that then you don't do you, you don't do the Joya method halfway, hmm? and and that's part of the problem. Some people saying, "Oh, I do the Joya method," and then they they only get to the data structure and think this is a theoretical contribution. You're absolutely right. Or alternatively, people say, "I've been coding the data, doing first order codes, second order codes, and they then don't show you the codes." And then they have a model that has no codes. It's like, I'm sorry, but where are the codes? No? Uh, or they don't show you the evidence, the data tables. It's like, well, but where's the evidence? No? Uh, so I think it's important that if you do it, you do it well, and all the various bits and pieces are there. Then, as I said, there may be um, opportunities for tweaking 
some no, they, they to adapting in in a, in a limited way uh, the data tables or the data structures to accommodate the particular research design. So there's nothing wrong in having a data table where the data are organized in two separate columns to show triangulation among different sources. It's actually showing that it's more robust hmm, than than uh, than otherwise. That's that's fine. That doesn't. Uh, uh, that doesn't betray the spirit of the model. And uh, if you have, uh, you could have the, the data structure showing convergence from different sources of data. And that's okay. That's still coherent with the spirit of the model. The problem is when the hacks are no longer consistent with the spirit of the model, which is, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, showing in a systematic way how you moved from raw data to your theoretical claims, which is based on the idea of this interpretive perspective, the idea of knowledgeable informants. Um, and once the, the hacks and the tweaks then undermine that, that's the problem. Then when it comes to bits and pieces uh, and, and then the, the, the methodological bricolage, so some of the pieces are nothing new in them, so I mean, meaning uh, a table where you show codes and selected evidence from quotes, from, 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 that's not necessarily the joy of method uh, it, it, in itself. It's something that can be taken and applied to any particular uh, qualitative case study to show selected evidence or whatever uh, coding you're doing. And, and, and then there's a lot of even discourse analysis, to some extent, you could claim that is based on, or some part, some forms of discourse analysis are based on a thematic coding of talk hmm, or, uh, or or writings, and you can still use some tables to show evidence, selected evidence of these discourses that you see in the in the data. Uh, I think the problem is when. It, like, I, like I did, unfortunately, in the paper that I show you, you call something a data structure and people think, oh, that's the joy of thing, the data structure. And then it confuses them because we don't have anywhere uh, something that says, look, this is what a data structure, when you do the joy of thing, a data structure should look like. What I've tried to do today, saying, look, this is the number of levels. These are the rules about the arrows. We don't have that. And, and, and so we can only infer these from observing published work. The problem is that published work, like mine in that case, contains some misleading mm, signals, then people are confused. and say, well, but this data structure looks very different from joyous data structure, but it's the data structure, I can do something like this. No, no, I'm sorry, sorry you shouldn't have called that a data structure. Don't look at this. Hmm? Right. Great, thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, that was a comprehensive answer to, to, to this um, difficult question. I see that we've started second uh, round of questions. So if I suggest that we have question, another question from Shan Yun and we finish with Ibrat's question because we are here for yes. more than three hours. So Shan Yun, I, I had a meeting uh, five minutes ago. But yeah. Shan Yun. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I could ask this question. May I please ask you, David, to elaborate a little bit on uh, the last two points when you talk about when this template most appropriate according to your experience, the one focused on concept rather than causal relationship or mechanism, and the point about focus on informants interpretation as opposed to factual observations. Thank you very much. Yes. So, uh, as I said, this is a, is a, is a way of analyzing data that focuses you on concepts. Now, Dennis Joya presents this and, and, and his co-authors, co collaborators, present this as, 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 a, as a method that is aimed at generating new concepts. So this is what this method is good at. It's not designed per se to help you understand mechanisms, to uh, highlight causal relationships. That's not what it does. Hmm? Uh, this doesn't mean that it obscures this. No, it's just that it doesn't quite help you in that direction. It helps you more if you want to generate new concepts. Hmm? 
And when it comes to, um, what was the last, mm, the, the other part you asked? Um, uh, focus on informants interpretation as post factual yes. observation. Thank you. Yes, because again, this method tends to prioritize, in, in the way it's been used, tends to prioritize uh, interviews, the informant's perspective. Okay, and that reflects the idea of knowledgeable informants, social construction of reality. So it's good for that. In when it comes to making more objective factual statements about things moving together, co-occurring sequences, then a case study is a more appropriate approach to qualitative data because a case study is flexible, is more, is more flexible about the sources of evidence that you choose. And you can have archival sources, you can have observations, you can have different sources that combined can support factual statements about regularities in your data. Aha, uh -huh. so if I do case study, I shouldn't use Joya method to analyze my data or? Careful. If you do a case study, you can still code your data, but it doesn't necessarily, the whole, your case study will not rest on a data structure, data table, like a Joya method. There would be more than that. Your data structure can help you show a bit of your analysis. So if you look at the paper, one of the papers that I mentioned today, my paper with Charlotte Cloutier, which by the way, I was supposed to meet 10 minutes ago, but I'm, she's patient and she knew that I was doing this. In that study, we do this, like we started with an open coding of the data, a data structure, but as we did that, we realized that there was a longitudinal dimension that we couldn't quite capture with the open coding following the Joya method. We realized that there was variance that we couldn't quite show in terms of longitudinal trajectories of change that we should, couldn't quite show if we remained in the confine of that method. So we kind of, kept some parts of the method in the sense we, we still coded the data and, and we still used some you know, data tables, tweaked data structure, tweaked, and we combined that with other moves, other techniques that we came up with. You know, we did methodologically innovate. Like we didn't have a method to track identity change over time. We, 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 we came up with one, we built it ourselves. Hmm? In terms of visual displays and classification criteria, that is methodological bricolage. And, uh, and that, that shows how you can use some parts, borrow some ideas and techniques from the, from the, uh, the, the Joya method as a platform, and then you build something more around it. I think that what, what Joya, what Joya, what Danny, I don't know, maybe it would be interesting to invite him over and discuss this, but what, what Danny means is that you don't do part of it. Either you do the whole thing or you don't do it. But the, the whole thing can be part of something bigger. That's, that is in my, in my view. 